Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. Their three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He has a jump, son! Chat, hvor de kan join i det klub. Øh, uh, user for dem med uh, webcam. Nå, ja, det, det får vi ikke... Det er for sent nu. Det får okay. vi ikke sat op i dag. Okay, cool nok. Jamen, jeg var bare, hvis det var. Og Juren, og Juren, han har heller ikke noget kamera stadigvæk. Ja. Ej, det, nej, nej, det er lige meget. Jeg skriver det bare. Stop. Du skal ikke bruge tid på det. Hej, hej. Godt, hej. Hello everybody and welcome to the GTR 24H Sprint Series highlights here from the Silverstone um, Grand Prix circuit. Another two hour race here of course where Pierluca Marto was able to take the pole position away from Tim Yarshall. They were on the front row alongside Luca Burke and also uh, one of the other Euronix cars able to play a big part in the championship a little bit later on. That was Leon Otoki, of course, in fourth position. We're getting a great start. It was Luca Burke, Brioni, shutting the gate pretty comprehensively there, but what was able to allow Yarshul through, unintentionally, of course, and indeed uh, Yarshul's Euronics teammate Otoki making a fantastic start uh, through Magnus and Beckett. So they would go side by side, but Otoki would get that position. Meanwhile, in the midfield, it was a little bit more feisty. Ross McGregor here accidentally hitting the back of Johannes Weiss, who lost a load of positions. And McGregor would lose even more with a drive-through penalty for his actions. Daniele Brambilla would once again be in all of the action. This is Luke Bennett trying to go right round the outside of him. Breaking very late, made a very good go of it, but couldn't quite get through on that occasion. Carl Leikegaard was also defending positions a little bit later on, but here's Luke Bennett getting through on Daniele Brambilla. Side by side through Maggots and Beckett's absolutely spectacular from Bennett on his debut in the series indeed. This is the moment I was talking about a moment ago, like a guard just swinging wide for Chris Vickers to let him through. They're the number 73 car, but that was all for non-points playing positions. This was for points though, and it was also very, very physical. Around the outside, or, or at least spinning around indeed, for Ralph Piringer there, after being tapped into it by Mikael Mo. Brambilla was able to get through uh, once again and retain that seventh position but he would be hampered later on with a big spin, helped, of course, by Sean Bennett and then hit by Ralph Perringer, who he came into contact with moments ago. Very unfortunate for 
all of those involved having got damage. This was a great battle. Sam and Crane and Luca Burke. Unfortunately, these two came. Look. Later on in that lap, Paul Simport were able to get or, or get Luca Burke back through again. Um, but uh, it's briefly disrupted. And finally, when Luca Burke got through, as you've just seen from Sam and Crane, that's because uh, Tim having Left. trouble with pit lane. We'll get to that later. Yeah. It's Danielli Brambilla and, and John Rowe having a great battle. I'm trying a little bit too hard to on that occasion. And okay. able to sweep around the outside. Very close between the two of them, but oh. able to get that position. Even in the end. And move up another place. Battle as well between Shepard and Fromel with Danielli Primavera, the oh. auto car, watching in behind. This is if these two have 25 minutes to go and it really on between these three. Vera with a nice one in and a good exit. It passed from out straight away. Trying to get alongside Schaefer but didn't quite see he was there. All three were ending up in a spin in the gravel. They would all pick up the pieces a little bit later on. Primavera would have to try and overtake from out again. Unfortunately they all make contact again through there at the loop. He would go wide. Schaefer would get both of the positions saying thank you very much and he would skip up the road. It wasn't done further in the midfield either. Big defence there from Matt Webb and Mitchie Hoyer trying to get right around the outside and into the loop once again. One of the main action areas throughout that race. It got very close between the two of them. Hoyer muscling out the Bentley. Hello. And then in his attempts to get through, Philip Maptic spinning around Matt Webb as they got caught up in a little bit of an accident. Did we touch? Uh, no, you didn't. It was the guy behind who hit you, I think. He just dabbed you a little. I don't think it's any worry. Despite that contact, Webb and Matzik were able to continue on that battle and the contact wouldn't end, I'm afraid. Matt Webb just about keeping up in front there, just uh, for a little bit of a muscly anyway, defensive manoeuvre. Um, here's Dan Kell and Miles Dixon battling really hard for the moment, final Ryan podium slot. Just over any, five minutes um, to go in the race and it was getting pretty dramatic okay. down here I was just gonna at say, the it, it seems Dan like Kell PC on the inside on this off. occasion would have at to hang moment. it around the outside for the second part but he managed it admirably and ended up getting that position and getting that podium in the end for the number 15 simply race San but they were all in the wake of Tiziano Brioni and Musto GD Esports who were able to extend their championship lead thanks in part to Burst Esports and Euronix uh, issues so throughout the race as I mentioned earlier for Tim Yarshall couldn't leave the pit lane in the end but it was okay Leone and Amato oh, on top, in the championship lead with Marco Pech and Dan Kell in second and third. you do but you don't have to worry about that anymore he has a job, son!
Simplexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. There are three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. Hello. Hey Nick. Hello. Can you hear me? Art. Sure. Yeah. I'll go. Yeah. Good afternoon, good evening, buonasera, and welcome to Misano for round 11 of the GTR 24H Sprint Series. We're here, we're hot, we're going to be having lots of action and a warm welcome to everyone watching, especially if you are watching live through Twitch, through YouTube, through Facebook, and especially so if you are watching live through Roku or Amazon Fire. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'm Yusuf Bin Sahel and joining me in the commentary room, in the production room, is Mr. Peter Moncom. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing okay tonight, I think. I'm a little bit stressed out because we had a lot of problems uh, before the stream started. And I just noticed that we, some, some way, somehow, we have a listen in on race control that was talking <laughs> on <laughs> top of us. So everything is not quite like that shouldn't be possible because it's all individual audio channels and that channel isn't open. So, well, I'm just a little confused, but, but I'm, go I'm okay. Well, you know what they say, Peter. Um, the more pressure, the better the diamond, right? Uh, I'm not. Something I'm not. Like I'm, I, I wouldn't call myself a diamond in any way, but now you did. So <laughs> you, you're a diamond in the rough, Peter. Diamond. Yeah, in the rough. very, very rough. <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm sure all of this pressure will um, shine you right up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not too serious. Yes, this is. Yet, this is still just the, the warm up. Um, the warm up before before the big show. You know, yeah, we're, we're mainly mainly here still just to have fun. Yeah, um, I'm sure we've got a lot of fun. We could be seeing a, a winner, a Sprint Series champion being crowned with uh, Musto GD on the cusp of winning the championship. All they need to do is make sure they do not lose six points over Euronics Gaming Team Intel and they will have the championship wrapped up in the bag. They currently have a 30 one point lead over Euronics after Euronics's DNF last time out, which you saw in that highlight video, which was lovely, comment or which was beautifully commentated on by Ewan O'Leary. And uh, Euronics has some issues in the pits, and uh, it saw them getting a DNF, another 25 points to Musto, and now, well, Euronics, they need to pull out all the stocks if they want to have any chance to win the championship come next round, the season finale in Monza. I want to put I want to put on the uh, the standings and hope that it's updated with the um, the results from Silverstone. Let's see. Well, let's see. It should be. Hopefully. There's there's it's... ten races on it right now, so that means it must be updated. Yeah. Right, so I'll, I'll run through the championship for everyone. So it's Musto who lead on 161, oh, 160 points, 31 points ahead of Euronix. They're on 129, and there, well, what was looking to be a three-race long winning streak comes to an end. Burst Esports Simplexity, they're in third place with 125 points, just a four shy of Euronix, having picked up no points in the previous three rounds. Simply race 
in fourth on 74 tied actually with Euronix gaming team razor they're flying up the order after a few very solid results last time out Bala Pala Motorsport are in seventh place on 62 just six shy of the second Musto GD team in sixth place at Paulson Sport in eighth on 58 with Simply Ray Sancho in ninth on 56 and then AAA Motorsports complete your top 10 just one point shy on 55 points Yeah, lots of teams. Lots of teams are close still. Yes, but I'm guessing Master will have to crash out in order to uh, to not secure the championship tonight. Well, as long as Euronix win tonight, they are guaranteed that they will take the championship to the next round in Monza, and then. Well, mm. who knows what can happen in Monza? Uh, the Temple of Speed and um, maybe the Temple of some crashes as well. Hey, wake up! Gonna, gonna, I, th I think we're going to see a lot of uh, Mercedes AMG GT cars at Monza. Is there Peter, a pattern? You, you just is there broke a pattern? It? Is there a pattern for the for the car selection? I was just going to say, Peter, well? you've broken our golden rule of the sprint series. Which is? You're not allowed to talk about car manufacturers until Ewan's here. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, no. We can talk about it now since you brought it up. Uh, yeah, since no, I broke no. it, now we can now we can smash it to bits. <laughs> but but when you and gets here and he's unhappy that we've already talked about this, it's on your head, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll take that one. I'll take um, one for the team. Because last time out at Silverstone, we saw a lot of Bentleys. Um, so. I was wondering what we would see come Misano, and you do get a few decently hey, long up. straights, but to be honest, it's more of a tight technical circuit used mainly in the MotoGP circus, so rather than on the F1 circus. Um, so we are seeing a couple of Aston Martins. Kyle Likegaard, he's in an Aston, and um, just trying to work out what car Mr. Alessandra Alexander Biazzito is in. Is yeah, that the D DSR team is actually talking on the TeamSpeak now, so I put the channel on just to listen in, but they're going to say something in Danish, I bet you. So You can translate uh, for us then. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to translate. No, they're not. No, they said not something right, right when we started listening. They started to just keep quiet. We're on the stream, shut up! <laughs> I, I, I do I do like how we have uh, team radios that we can uh, tap into at any time. Uh, what I don't like is that the PC you're on right now is suffering from a horrible frame rate. Like, it's losing frames all over the place. Well, that is not um, the best of news, Peter. If no. You know, I can uh, log on into our backup PC if you can, think that can, uh... can Can you be PC2 instead? I can be PC too. Yeah. And then uh, we can have John or one of the other guys. Let me uh, switch yeah, John over. Was, John was poking me as well two minutes ago. Right. Aha, I am in on the other PC. Now I just need to remember how to access it on the broadcasting tool by changing this lovely old port to the right port. Yeah, and that's a problem. That's the, like, <laughs> it's going to be even worse with the R Factor 2 races. Hey, there we go. Right. Because then the, then, then, the, um, then the guys that aren't in the studio are going to have to remember four port, no, eight ports. So, yeah, we're going to have oh, to fix I've got that. it all written down, Peter. If you can, if you can select the timetable as well, so we get the uh, full. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'm still very much new to a set of four serial controls. I just press broadcasting, and then I yeah. press drivers, and something happens. There's actually, there's actually a new option as well. There's the track map option. So if, if you put Ooh, up, I'm I'm try it. Go ahead and try it. Ooh, that that's spicy. See, that's going to be very useful for when I forget how this and, track goes. Even and the one. Um, it's supposed to have the car that you're following right now with the red car. I think it does, yes. But that's the number one ca car, or... No, it says 557 on my screen. Yeah, that's position number one. Yeah, 557. Uh, okay, I get it, I get it. That that's very cool. That is actually equally laggy. Okay, as um, 
Alexander Bietzi. So decides to yeah. turn left at the right and uh, resets to the pit lane. I'm suspecting John will be working on the um, working on the graphic settings because this is not working. Uh, it's a frame rate still dropping for you, Peter. Yeah, it is. This is still horribly laggy. Well, it seems that there is nothing I can do, so I will. No, no, no! You, we just need to come. It's, there's yeah. nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do. We will. We'll wait. Even we'll need to wait. So yeah. That is John. And um, hopefully all of the issues will be sorted out nicer uh, and uh, speedily, especially because we do have qualifying starting soon. And then we'll have the race in I think it's 25 minutes after that. So we do have some time to um, iron out all issues that may be occurring at the present point in time. What lap times are we starting to see? 35.7 for BXC. So we'll see whether um, Michael can improve on that in the 112 car. He makes his way across the line, and it is a 35-9 for the MSB Racing driver. Only two tenths shy of Bietzitsa, but Peter, whenever we're talking about Sprint Series, we have to be talking about the likes of Tim Yarshall and um, Pierre Luca Amato and Tiziano Brioni, of course, because those three, I think Tim Yarshall more so than Luca Schmidt, they are insanely quick come qualifying and they always find that little extra bit out of the car to find themselves you know almost half a second clear of third place uh, like like yashil's a, a, a the, the yashil phenomenon mm -hmm. in qualifying i i would say uh how many pole positions has he secured now three many. four i don't know i don't have the exact stats i think all would probably be a reasonable amount I think it's something like that. It's something like that. He is, he is crazy. Uh, he's crazy fast at qualifying. The problem, though, with this or the way it's set up, is that you have to do the driver change. So you have to have another driver in your car as well. So you yes. you, you can't just do the two hours by yourself. So at some point um, you'll need. That being said, Lucas Schmidt is by no means a slow driver. He's on par with Tim Yarshall in race pace at the very least. And, you know, he's up there in qualifying as well. Even if he was piloting the uh, Euronix gaming team in qualifying, he'd still put it at least P2, maybe even in pole as well. But Tim Yarshall is just in qualifying. He is an absolute madman. But as you highlighted there, Peter, um, driver change is not the strongest suit for Euronix. Of course, they had that DNF last time out at Silverstone due to not being able to complete their driver change and they were just stuck in the pits. And that was their race weekend over. And in in a position where it looked like they were going to jump into the lead of the championship as well so it was all so tight and then that one issue and now it looks like musto practically have the championship in the bag yeah sorry i was texting john we're trying to figure out what's up with the lagginess of the image because it's not supposed to be like that um Well, I this is taking a look at some of the other drivers Wait out up. on circuit then. Pesquedo is out at the moment. That's Alessio Pesquedo in the second Musto car. Got Lucas Schmidt out at the moment for Euronix as well as Pierre Luca Amato. So quite a few of the big names are out on track. Let's also not forget um, Luca Burke as well because Luca Burke in the number 15 simply race car. They got some decent points last time out at Silverstone and they currently find themselves sitting in ninth place in the championship and they could be jumping very high up if they get a good result here at Misano. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, usually if you're gonna you're gonna have to excuse me because I'm, no, I'm, I'm I'm more working on trying to get, trying to figure out what is going on here. You do your thing, Peter, and I will keep our viewers entertained. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not really that entertaining uh, right now. I've I've I have too much to keep an eye on. Um, I was trying to listen to what you're saying, but it's really hard to focus when uh, when I have three PCs to control as well. No problem at all. So we've got 12 cars out in practice at the moment. Over half of them are currently in the pits. Uh, Philip Matzik, Miles Dixon, Chris Vickers, and Lucas Schmidt are your four currently out in circuit as Miles Dixon just 
Love to prove me wrong. So many drivers love to do that. He does into <laughs> the pit. So now it's just three drivers out on circuit. And we're taking a, a look at a Lucas Schmidt, who set a 36.4 last time around. And that would be enough for uh, a P3 in practice. Although Lucas Schmidt through the final corner and across the line. We'll see what it is. It's looking uh, fairly quick across the line. It's a 35.6 for the Italian, which would be enough uh, for P2 because the 112 of uh, Michael and I'm going to try to pronounce the surname in Yelso? Yelso? Yelso. Yelso. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was somewhat close. I'll give, me, well, I'll give yeah, myself a 5 enough. out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. That's pretty good. Um, he's put in a 35.36 and um, he's in pole for practice if that does count for anything. But come qualifying, there's just that little extra gear that I'm sure the Euronix and Musto team will be pulling out. Now, something that I was speaking to you and with last week and uh, or two weeks ago, I should say, and for any of our viewers who didn't, who didn't or were unable to tune in two weeks ago, has actually... Speaking of the devil, you and O'Leary, I believe, is in the commentary booth with us. You and I. I am there. indeed. Yeah, I am. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you doing, Ewan? Evening. I'm good. I'm uh, ready, raring to go. Uh, waiting, of course, for uh, qualifying in a moment, but uh, yeah, re ready and uh, excited for the race, of course. Perfect. So, as I was saying, you know, last week we were discussing, you know, how close it was between Musto and Euronics, but. One of the biggest things to consider is not just the fact that Euronix are fast, but their sister team, their second team, the Razor team, are also very quick. And that's Leon Otoki and uh, Marco Pech. And maybe they'll be able to put a thorn in the side of Musto and just ruin their parade a little bit here at their home track of Misano. Yeah, quite possibly. Obviously, that's what they'll be hoping to do here. Uh, Yarshall and Schmidt are the ones in contention for this championship. And the 58 are kind of in the contention for the for the small championship if you like the battle for fourth is kind of raging at the moment and it's quite entertaining actually um but they'll definitely try and be a thorn in the side of uh, mustos try and spoil the party just a little bit although they've not uh, got into the server just yet i'm sure they will come here i was actually wondering between myself whether ironics would bother coming at all this week because of the disaster that they had last week however it's good to see that they're not giving up at all and they're still trying to win this championship despite the odds being uh, very steeply stacked against them at this point. Yeah, it is very steeply stacked against them and after such a strong run that they were showing in the last few races for it to all go downhill at Silverstone is awful for them. And if anyone's wondering, again, what Euronics need to do to take the championship to the final round at Monza, they need to take six of points or more out of Musto tonight. So if they win, they are guaranteed to take the championship to the final round. Yeah, that's great news. And interestingly, uh, Leon Otoki has loaded in in a Lamborghini, which we haven't seen um, for a very long time in this series. I don't believe we've seen that at all so far. Um, so that is an interesting car choice. Um, but it's uh, good to see it out there anyway. I just hope that it's not going to completely fall flat on its face throughout this uh, throughout this race because sometimes with the less popular cars, I remember in, in this game at least a few months ago, the Gallardo was particularly dreadful. Um, but um, I'm hoping, I think it might be, go I don't even know if the Hurricane is in this game. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but uh, I don't know how it performs really. And given that nobody's actually used it yet, um, I think it's a bit of a risk. But it'll be interesting to see nevertheless. And I think the last time you and that we saw um, drivers, you know, really going against a trend and taking some, th taking a car manufacturer that no one else was, was I think the Simply Race duo. That was back at Laguna Seca where they both picked up Bentleys. And to be fair, they did a pretty good job in those Bentleys. BMWs. Um, oh, it was BMWs. Yeah, the, yes, thank you. Because <laughs> they go for the, uh, the the Bentleys pretty much every week. Um, but, um, yeah, they, they went for the BMWs on that particular occasion. And uh, it didn't work out too badly for them. Got a uh, fourth position and a seventh position with that one. So um, it, it wasn't too bad in the end. But uh, we've just started qualifying now. So 25 minutes um, in of the session. And uh, we've got... Uh, some of the cars going out on outlaps right now to see uh, who's going to take pole. Can um, we uh, grab two hours a at commercial break just quickly, guys, so you can get um, and, to the start of qualifying? And on that note, we're going to be heading, or I should say, jumping right on into a commercial break. 
And when we're back, we will be bringing you the remainder of a qualifying all the way to the end uninterrupted. So do stay tuned for that. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He has a jump, son! Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. Their three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the GTR 24H Sprint Series live from Misano and you and we are into qualifying. We're a few minutes in and we've already got some lap times down. Alessio Puskedu currently topping the timing sheets with a 134.3. Yeah, Musto are on top early on here, but uh, it's not the Musto car we were expecting, actually. The number 98 Mercedes has uh, gone to the front and not the 71, which is leading the championship at the moment. Luca Schmidt is coming through the final corner at the moment for Euronics. We're going to see where this puts him. Presumably, it's going to be up towards the front because we haven't seen him anywhere lower than that throughout the whole of the season. Comes across the line at the moment, and it looks like he hasn't been able to get a proper lap time in there. It's a 35-0, but... Um, an invalidation, a corner cut of some description seems likely and I've seen quite a few of those actually through qualifying and through practice and um, it seems that the, the, uh, the track limits are very hard to abide by in this circuit because there's just so much tarmac runoff everywhere um, but it's kind of difficult to stay on the circuit at some points it seems. Yeah, and it's not just uh, because you can run wide, as we actually see Alexander Biatizzo doing on the run through uh, turn 8 but you can also cut a lot of curb, especially through some of the slower corners, you know, like turns of four and five and, you know, the entire first section. And here comes John Munro, currently on a 35-2. We'll see whether he can improve. It's a 35 dead for the Britishman. Very close between a couple of those guys at the moment. It's uh, still Puskeda leading, but Amato has got very, very close to him. And they're the championship leaders. And then um, further behind, it is quite close between Payic and uh, then Munro, Biazizo. They're all, they're all up there. They're all uh, as to be expected, really. And when you get 11 rounds into a season like we are now, you start to 
um, outline the real usual suspects that you see at the front of the field and we're seeing um, exactly the guys we'd be expecting to with the possible exception of Matic who's a little bit further down than I was personally expecting through the first part of this, uh, of this qualifying session but you know, it's still the, the main teams of this series Musto, Euronix, Simply Race and Butler Powell occupying the first um, six spots on the grid at the moment yeah and uh, it's a 1-2 for the Italians at their home race so far and something that I was actually discussing with uh, Peter Ewan before uh, you joined us was um, Lucas Schmidt versus Tim Jarschel and you were really play praising uh, Tim for just how quick he was in qualifying and arguably being you know the quickest man on the field when it comes to qualifying pace but Euronics are opting to send out Lucas Schmidt to do their qualifying run so let's see what the German can pull out and whether he can um, get a clean lap in and jump ahead of those Italians for that top spot. I think, to be honest, Jarshaw might be put to better use in the second stint, really. I know he's a better qualifier than Luca Schmidt, but um, I think Tim Jarshaw is very good at hot lapping on his own. You know, some people just, quite frankly, get bored of running on their own, and they want to be in battles all the time, and they can't really produce their pace that they need to. But Jarshaw can just lap around um, hot laps all day long, almost like a robot, really. So I think in the second stint, if it does get spread out and it does get... Um, a little bit uh, hot lap-esque, then we really could see that uh, Yarshall make some big inroads. And even if Schmidt hands the car over with a 10-second deficit to the front of the race, then I think Yarshall won't even mind that very much. I think he'll still be able to pull that back, even against people like Tiziano Brioni, who's going to be taking the second half of the race um, for uh, Musto 71, and uh, Trevor Jackson, who's going to be taking the second half of the race um, for the number 98. Yes. And we're taking a look at the moment at uh, Philip Matzik in the 556 five, Butler Power Motorsport car. And uh, just double checking where they are in the championship. They're currently sitting uh, P14. No, that's a 557, five, pardon me. 557, five, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and we're also seeing now what cars everyone's going for. As you mentioned, it's the Lamborghini for the Euronix Team Razor. But the main Euronics team, which is what Luca Schmidt's currently driving down in 14th place, that's the Audi, and it's a lone Audi as well. Yes, that's uh, a, well, it could be quite concerning for them actually, um, being the lone Audi at the moment. Just going to um, look at what they're up to at the moment. The, here, the 57, still challenging for the title, don't forget, but um, it's a long shot from here. We'll see if they can actually get themselves up towards their teammates, uh, Marco Pejic and Leon Otoki, who are currently in third place. Obviously, Pejic with that lap in the Lamborghini. Schmidt over the line now, fifth place for him, just under a second away from Buschedu. Maybe not the best car choice they could have had, and maybe they haven't actually got the actual driver pace that they need, but... Um, because to be honest, those Musto cars look frighteningly quick, actually. But um, yeah, it, that, not a bad time there from Luca Schmidt. And don't forget that Tim Yarsha was arguably faster. So it, maybe if he was in the car, he'd be able to pull something a little bit more special out of the back. But um, yeah, still not a bad time and not a bad place to be in fifth place. Yeah, and it is interesting, um, as we were talking about, Tim Yarsha not starting in the qualifying because... While I do agree with you, you and that Team Yarshall is able to be slightly robotic and just put in those laps time after time again. We have seen drivers, you know, the, the man who does a qualifying time, we have seen team switch. So despite someone putting in a qualifying time, they then switch out the drivers and the second driver will start the race. So, well, maybe that can still happen for Euronix. Maybe they'll still put Team Yarshall out first, but... We will have to wait and see. 16 minutes left of qualifying and it's still the Italians leading the way. Alessio Puschedo and Pierluca Amato at the top of the standings. Marco Pejic just improved ever so slightly there to a 34-4, edging ever closer to those uh, couple of Mercedes uh, at the front of the field, but um, not anywhere near really. There's still a 5 tenth buffer between the two kind of sections of the grid at the moment. Amato seems to be improving and he does improve on that lap but he can't get within a tenth of his teammate Alessio Puschetto seems to have really really gone very very well on that first lap out because he hasn't been able to get anywhere near it and neither has anybody else well, and uh, speaking of people who aren't able to get near Puschetto and Amato 
Lucas Schmidt and John Monroe, they've set the identical time of a 34.713. But as Lucas Schmidt set his time afterwards, he is uh, currently behind John Monroe in fifth position. Yeah, he is. And uh, just falling into the clutches uh, of John Clements in behind him. A man we haven't seen pretty much for the whole of the season so far, driving at that rookie monster's 37. It'll be interesting to see who takes over that car from him. We've seen that Rookie Monsters car loads of times throughout the um, throughout the season. Is it going to be um, Matt Beavis, Mantis Wreckers, or maybe even one of the other drivers? But uh, they do have a couple of cars in here, uh, Rookie Monsters. Chris Vickers is also driving, presumably along Hinsai here once again, who was involved in a few incidents and accidents towards the end of the race. And Paul Simsport weren't particularly pleased with him, but I think it was all civil after the race um, between those guys. Still, we're going to find out who the second drivers are a little bit later on. These are the qualifying drivers, of course, and as I mentioned, John Clements just doing really well there, despite not having driven almost at all throughout this season so far. And if you remember back to Silverstone as well, you and 14 Rookie hey, Monsters, it was actually Simon Marshall who made his uh, debut in the Sprint Series, and... Um, you know, he wasn't far off the pace, but it was actually quite surprising because despite him being a little bit slower than, I believe, it was Matt Beavis at the time, they actually opted to keep Simon Marshall out for probably about 60% of the race rather than maybe pitting him a little bit before that 50% mark. Yeah, it's a, a little bit of a, a, a difficult one to work out, really, this strategy. You can seemingly go a long way on a set of tyres and a tank of fuel, pl uh, a one hour 10 plus, which is more than I would have expected, especially at the start of the season, um, seeing this. So um, it's kind of surprising, but it does open up the strategy. You can pit early for an undercut, you can stay out late for an overcut, uh, and in the end, it, uh, it all evens out and converges at the end, making some very exciting racing indeed. But... Lucas Schmidt at the moment trying to improve his qualifying position just a little bit, trying to get himself onto those front two rows. And if he improves even by a thousandth of a second, he's going to move up a place. And it looks like he is going to blow that time out of the water at the moment. Coming across the line, he does improve by nearly five tenths, but it's he see it seems he has had a a, a cut or an extend somewhere, and his lap time is invalid. Yeah, his lap time has indeed been invalidated at 34.278. Would have been enough to put him in P3 ahead of his Euronix teammate of Marco Payic. So, Lucas May is going to have to go back out and improve on that time all over again. And actually, Ewan, wasn't it last time out at Silverstone that we saw a few drivers on personal best times and then not completing their laps? Yeah, I think it was last time, and it was the strangest thing I've seen for, for quite a long time. Uh, I was trying to think of theories as to why on earth that would be the case, but in the end, we really couldn't get to the bottom of it, and we still don't really know why that was taking place, but... Um, it, it was Euronics, wasn't it? It was Marco Pejic or Leon Otoki. It was the teammates of a championship contender, so it was either Euronics or Musto, but I'm happy to go along with the Euronics, because it, Marco Pejic definitely looks like a very fast qualifier at the moment, so... Um, yeah, I can I can imagine so, but yeah, it really was a bizarre thing to see. Um, we ha haven't seen that so far this race. Purely, it's just been um, corner cuts and track extending that have really hampered lap times so far here today. But um, yeah, that really was quite peculiar last time out, um, and uh, we never really found out why. But Lucas Schmidt is uh, not really bothered about that anymore. Firmly pushing Silverstone behind him. Um, hopefully so. Anyway, as he comes over the line now, it looks like that was um, invalid he again. down across the line as well. Yeah, he must have uh, oh, no. invalidated or something. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think he completed the lap time because it's still a 34.278, which is the same thing as what he did last time around. As he has come to Pierre Luca Amato, across the line is a 33.6, and that will put him in provisional pole a tenth ahead of his teammate. Yeah, he does get there, and uh, that in incidentally, Musto, the only team to get into the 33s. Everybody else languishing outside of that, which is um, very disappointing for them, and they might be wishing they picked the Mercedes, because um, the only two Mercedes cars on the grid are the only two going extremely fast, but it seems that uh, car choice is really, really split throughout this field and it's uh, nice to get a bit of variety at the front of the field we're going to have some good battling and um, some intriguing battles where cars are going to be faster in one portion of the circuit and then slower in another and that makes things uh, very very exciting to watch indeed so it bodes well for the race that's for sure and we've got nine different manufacturers which 
might be the most we've seen all season. We always get some McLarens because the number 12 car of MSB Racing always picks the McLaren. Uh, but we've got Lexus, we've got Aston Martin, Lamborghini for the first time, or at least the first time that I've seen since joining back at round three in Zolder. Uh, we've got the Bentley, Audi, and of course the Mercedes as well. Pretty sure it is the first time the Lamborghini has been in the Sprint Series at all this season. I don't remember it at any point um, so far. Um, I'm not entirely sure if the Huracan was in the game when we started this season. Uh, about three months ago, in that, I think it was. At uh, round 11. And, uh, yeah, this, uh, it's been a great season so far. Obviously, put all some around. It feels like um, the, the uh, kind of uh, sunset of this season is kind of approaching now, but... Um, it's still going to be very, very good to watch, that's for sure, as it has been all season, of course, as John Monroe comes over the line. And he does not, well, he does improve, but again, it won't count. A lot of uh, those kind of lap times are coming up. Marco Pejic is also improving. We'll see if he does finish his lap, and we'll see if it actually counts as well when he crosses the line. However, I can't see him getting anywhere near the top two. Okay, Ewan, we, we've done almost 20 minutes of, um, I'd like to say, serious commentary. It's now time for us to start talking about the, um, the conspiracies. Are you ready for these, Ewan? Uh, well, I didn't know there were any, but yes, that's, uh... Oh, there's yeah, all the conspiracies. We, well, yeah. I mean, that's a conspiracy, isn't it? You make a conspiracy out of nothing. Yeah, come yeah. on then. What's, okay. What is it? So, I was, I was gonna say, Musto, as long as they finish ahead of Euronics, even if they finish behind, but if they finish ahead, they definitely have the championship wrapped up in the bag. However, the Mustard's second team, they're still in a tight battle with the Euronic second team and Simply Race, as well as some of the other cars behind them, like Butler Pal. If, if we're in a situation where the Mustard first team, they're winning, and the Mustard second team are in second, do they give the team order to do multi-21 Mustard, multi-21? Hmm, quite possibly, actually. Um, I can see that happening, definitely, because... Uh, typically, typically, when you've uh, got such a lead like this, and it looks like they are going to uh, race out to a lead if they have the pace in the race that they have right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I could definitely see that happening um, throughout this race. And if it does, then uh, I know you're going to be very pleased that you've figured that out. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a possibility, and I can see that happening. However, I just, uh, it, for all of the um, drama that we're, well, not manufacturing, but... Um, that, that we're kind of hyping up here for fourth position. Um, I don't know how seriously these guys are going to be taking it, whether they're just going to um, battle for race results or if they actually are going to uh, focus on the uh, fourth place in the championship as an actual objective they want. Yeah. Uh, so Marco Payet, he improves as a 34.2, but once again, we see another driver invalidating their time. So that lap won't count for Marco. Um, but... To keep on going with the conspiracies, Ewan, I, I don't know how we'll react if heading into turn one, Marco Payet hits Pierre Luca Amato and they both go spinning. I, I genuinely don't know how we're going to react to that. Well, neither do I, but hopefully we don't have to um, at uh, any point. Um, interestingly, by the way, uh, the 57 has just disconnected from the session, I believe, Luca Schmidt has uh, disconnected and we're down to 14 for the moment. Hopefully we, he can get back in, but um, I think it was an untimely disconnection last week for Burst that meant they could not compete in the race and they were ultimately not quite out of the championship uh, yet, but their, their job is also very difficult. And since they're not here, uh, then their job is very, very difficult um, for them to win the championship because uh, they're not going to at this point. Um, but, uh, yeah, interesting that they've uh, disconnected. Hopefully they can get back in the session. And uh, John Clements has also jumped up the order there. Fifth position for Rookie Monsters, and, and that's a great drive for those guys. Uh, they've not really been up towards the front of the field for quite a long time, to be honest. Currently down in 11th in the championship, and the last time they um, got into the top five was at Zolda all the way back around three. So it's been a very long time since they've been in the top five. However, they've just managed it right now of John Clements. Yeah, John Clements doing a fantastic job for Team Rookie Monsters. That fifth place at Zolda was um, their best position of, sorry, their, that was fourth position back at Zolda was their uh, best finish of the entire season. They've had one fifth as well. That was back at Brands Hatch, but aside from that, hasn't really been too many points going their way. So they could really do with these points and, um, 
it really bringing them up into the fight for um, P4, which is currently being led by Simply Race. Yeah, it is, and it's uh, very tight as well, indeed. But uh, currently watching Pierlu Kamato, or I am anyway. I am anyway. But uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, very smooth on my end right now. Hopefully, it is for everybody watching on at home. Um, but uh, yeah, Pierlu Kamato still leading the session. And Pusqueda has got a little bit closer to him away from the cameras, but uh, Amato was able to extend his margin again on the last lap. He did a 33-4, which is even faster. Um, so uh, he is not showing any signs of slowing down throughout this session. Peach is improving, but Amato is just improving more and just keeping ahead by enough to keep this pole position provisionally uh, quite comfortably. Yeah, Luca Amato is half a second quicker than third and over a second quicker than fourth. The pace that the Musto drivers are showing is absolutely disgusting. And to be fair, it's what we expected. We expected the top four, the two Euronix drivers and the two Musto drivers just to be in a world of their own. But Luca Schmidt, well, he's had that untimely disconnect. Euronix with another disconnect. Last time out, it happened in the middle of the race when they made their pit stop. And this time, well, it's happened in the middle of qualifying. And unless Marco Pejic can find something miraculous, it's going to be an all-Italian front row, an all-Musto front row. Yeah, two Italians driving two German cars, which is kind of the... It's, I find it quite interesting that uh, the Germans are driving the Italian cars and the Italians are driving the German cars. It's just a kind of complete oxymoron, really, this, uh, this whole race so far. But, um, or this whole... Uh, session so event but uh, yeah it's it's uh, it's still interesting to see uh, those kind of dynamics going on but these guys just setting themselves up really quite a lot on outlaps quite a lot in the pit lane just preparing themselves for one final assault here we've got three minutes to go and um, the track is going to be at its fastest here very very shortly um, so there's going to be some very fast times and very quick times coming onto the board here later on Okay, what I'm going to do, let, I'm going to ride on board with P2 man Alessio Piscedu and take you guys through a hot lap here at uh, Misano as Alessio makes his way down to turn four called Rio, you know, just showing off a little bit of knowledge there. And this right-hander really opens up, but you have to keep it to the right anyway so that you can slingshot your way out through turn six on to the back straight through the kink of turn seven and just get ready to absolutely slam on the brakes it down for turn A Equeroa. And uh, again, another corner that opens out that little bit. Pull the car back over to the left as you make your way into turns 9 and 10. And it's just a constantly closing corner or um, lessening radius, as one might say. So you can carry a lot of speed in, but you have to be constantly trail braking all the way through. Back on the power and into, without doubt, the best part of the set or of the track. Through turn 11, you carry so much speed, and now into turn 12, and with each right-hander, it gets slower and slower and slower. Through turn 13, and now into the hairpin of turn 14, and now just two corners remaining. Easy on the throttle on the exit, pull it over to the right, throw the car in to the left-hander of turn 15, and now into the final corner, which is called the same as the track, Misano. Back on the power, and that is a lap here at Misano. There's some very strange corner names around here, I must say, particularly at Rio down there at turn five, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what that's all about and why this truck has got a, such a close relationship with Rio, but uh, apparently it has. just aren't the greatest with their geography, potentially. Well, that's uh, quite a theory, um, but, uh, yeah, it seems that uh, maybe not, um, apparently. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting circuit here, really. It's a... I don't really know how to describe it, to be honest, but it's unlike, um, it's very, very unique, there's nothing really quite like it, um, it does provide some good overtaking opportunities at turn, or, or, or the kind of don't sweepers at 11, 12 and 13, well, yeah, I know, I just did, kind of, but, um, <laughs> there are some good uh, overtaking opportunities around here, but, um, the thing I like most about it is that the overtaking opportunity down there at, the, at turn 14 is particularly exciting because it's quite sketchy. Um, so uh, the overtakes that we will undoubtedly see after the back straight there um, are going to be quite sketchy and quite interesting to watch. Yeah, and it's just going to be how brave do you dare go through. Well, it's a quadruple right-hander, 11, 12, 13, and then into 14. And, I mean... 
I've been watching Misano so often from, you know, motorcycle racing, and it's, you know, fantastic seeing them overtake, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the GT cars and diving it down into turn 14 and to pull off those maneuvers. But the checkered flag is out, and Alessio Pischetto will improve ever so slightly, but it won't be enough to topple his teammate Pierluca Amato stays in provisional pole from now. The only man who can really challenge Pierluca is going to be Marco Pejic. Yeah, it is at this point, and uh, I'm unsure if he's going to be able to do it. Coming out of uh, turn seven, now down towards turn eight, the, that kind of sweeping hairpin here in his uh, Lamborghini. Only a couple of guys out there at the moment. Three on lap times, uh, four actually, including Amato. Just behind him is Miles Dixon trying to improve for Paul Simsport. Just a tenth would lift him into the top five. Uh, as we've got 14 at the moment, it doesn't look like 57 is actually going to be able to rejoin, which is incredibly sad to see. Um, but, uh, yeah, it looks like Amato and uh, Brioni are going to be able to get the championship uh, even by not turning up here because uh, the 57 have unfortunately not been able to um, get those issues sorted. But Marco Pejic, his, their teammates at least, coming through the final couple of corners. We'll see now if he can lift the mood just a little bit for Euronics and kind of save the day for the whole team. Uh, we will have to see. It's looking very sketchy at the moment for Euronics, and we, you just have to hope that the Intel team... So, never mind, the session has ended. Marco Pejic runs white. He was not going to improve. So... It is the All-Italian, the All-Musto front row of the grid, Pierluca Amato, ahead of Alessio Pescedu. It is indeed. Sorry for, sorry for that, by the way. But uh, it, we're uh, going towards the race now. I think we'll just squeeze in a quick commercial break before we do indeed get there. Um, so make sure you join us after it. You're currently watching the GTR 24H Sprint Series from Mazzano, and the race is coming up after this. you do but you don't have to worry about that anymore he has a cup, son! Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. There are three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization.
Welcome back to the GTR 248 Sprint Series here from Mazzano, the penultimate round, round 11 here in Italy to for a bit of an Italian finish to this season. In two weeks we go to Monza, but uh, these guys will be worrying about this race, of course. Two hours as always, and these guys are just about to get on the way for their formation corner. Um, as I'm going to call it really because um, they're kind of on the short shoot between the penultimate and the final corner not much of a formation lap at all but it's going to be Amato Puskedi on the front row two Mercedes and uh, two Musto cars on the front row at the moment holding them just there on the front straight at the moment with a Toki and Munro trying to get their way through as we go green it looks like that Lucas Mitt's going to try and go through the middle of both Musto cars we'll see if he can manage it not quite it looked like Amato has taken the lead around turn one and two but the Ronics have managed to get their way into second place it's Marco Pejic who takes that position who's getting he's going to be shuffled down to third and in the background he actually looks like it's been a pretty clean start it has indeed, unless you are John Clemens and a Team Rookie Monson, because he's got a drive to penalty in the Porsche, so that is a disaster for Rookie Monsters. He's going to be serving that in, well, either this lap or the next lap, most uh, likely. But it is the Italian Pierluca Amato leading the way from Marco Payet and Alessio Pischetto. But the biggest news is, Euronix, the main team, they weren't able to make the race, which means your champions of the entire sprint series will be a Musto GD Corsa. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what they do in this uh, race now. They are going to win the championship regardless with that lead that they have of 31 points. Now, it looks like they're going to take a very good result out of this, but Euronix and Musto are going to be uh, looking for bragging rights here. There's not much more than that, but they will definitely still want them. Two massive teams in the world of sim racing. They will want one up on each other, no matter where it comes from and how high the stakes are. But further down in the field it looks like it's actually been clean from everybody but the bass thing has been fierce throughout the field and there you can see the Porsche of John Clemens are diving right into the pit so he's going to get this drive through done and dusted as soon as he can but just as we saw in qualifying and now we're seeing in the race as well the top three they're in a class of their own Mosto and Euronics you mentioned these are two big names in sim racing they are indeed and they're also two big names here at Misano as well yeah, they are. It, uh, it seems early on in qualifying that it was going to be just Musto at the front of the field running away with it, but Euronics have really added themselves to this party. They've kicked the door in, really, and kind of forged an invite, and uh, they're in second place at the moment, just one second away from Amato, who leads very bumpy across the curbs in the background there for Miles Dixon of Paul Simsport. He's chasing down John Munro for best of the rest, really, in fourth place, but, um, yeah, just... Coming round at lap number two here, about halfway round at the moment. It's uh, it all settling down now, really. John Clements is going to have a lot of work to do uh, later on, but he's going to be very fun to watch trying to battle his way through this field. Yeah, so it's always, I mean, as much as we hate to say it, it's always rather entertaining when one of the front runners gets a drive through penalty of some sort because it means we get to see them uh, fighting through the field. It adds a little bit of excitement as that's a Bentley, that's uh, Alexander Biazzizzo, pardon me, the Lexus going down the inside, I think, and that's someone running completely wide through turn 11. Yeah, I believe that's Carl Lyke. No, it's not indeed. It's Chris Vickers who's falling back through the field very quickly indeed. He was seventh a couple of moments ago, as you can see on the left-hand side. But uh, at the next sector line, he's going to be pushed down to at least ninth, maybe even tenth here if uh, Philip Mapsik has anything to say about it. He's going to try and follow his teammate through. Biazizo has got it already for Butler Pal. And now Matzik is going to try and do the same, but it looks like Vickers has just regathered himself a little bit here and got onto the back of the Lexus straight away once again. But Ooh. not the greatest start for Rookie Monsters throughout this race. The 37 had a drive through, and the and the 73 is now falling through the field by on its own accord, really. However, yeah, they are Chris, fighting back. Chris Vickers, his, his eyes must be glowing red right now. He's all over the back of Bietzitsa, so whatever issue he had, whatever mistake he had, he's not letting that affect him. He is right back on the pace. He runs a little bit wide as he follows Bietzitsa over the, the sleeping policemen, I guess you could call them, here at Misano. And Chris Vickers coming under a little bit of freshers uh, from the second Butler Pal Motorsport car, but it looks like we have a very entertaining battle here for P8. He's found himself in a bit of a Lexus sandwich here as Chris Vickers for Rookie Monsters. He's going to want to fight his way out of this sandwich um, in, a, in a few moments' time. But 
He's just keeping that tight line through turn 9 and 10 and the run towards 11 which is a very fast sweeping corner and it's where he came unstuck being pushed wide presumably by somebody else um, a little bit earlier on but it's all single file uh, for these guys just going to check on Marco Pejic up front because I think he was under a bit of pressure from uh, Puskedu if he was he's fought it off but um, the pressure is now mounting on him and he's going to have to uh, be a little bit defensive here before long and this is all helping Amato because Payich is going to have to look in his mirrors a little bit more he's not going to be quite as pacey because he's trying to defend from somebody while trying to go fast at the same time and so it's all playing into the hands of the 71 who is still leading yeah and don't forget Pusquedo was quicker than Payich in qualifying so you would expect him to have the pace over the German oh I believe it's no it's not German it's uh Czech driver if i'm not mistaken but you'd expect him to have the pace over marco page in the race nonetheless so Pisquetto will want to get this move done as quickly as possible and then try to close in to his italian teammate a croatian german by the way is uh, marco page he's kind of a half and half i'm not entirely what, sure what percentage uh, of each he is but uh, but there, there you have it um Man of, uh, man of two different cultures there um, in P2 uh, at the moment. Still trying to defend from Puschetto at the moment. Um, but it seems that the battles and the trains and um, the things that we're used to seeing in the sprint series are all back here, really, for the lower end of the points. And that's a trend that we've been seeing um, a little bit later on in the season, really, is that at the front of the field, we've seen some classic battling between Euronics and Musto, but they haven't been battling all race long. Um, however, these guys at the back are just constantly overtaking each other and then being overtaken again and then uh, doing the same right back at their opponents. So um, the entertainment really is down here in the midfield. Um, and uh, it's a bit like F1 in that respect, I suppose. But uh, it's obviously the sprint series lasts a little bit longer and a little bit more exciting as well. Yeah, that entertainment factor stays with you for a good uh, two hours, especially if we get some rain on the way. I don't think we're going to be getting any here at Misano. It is an absolutely lovely day down here in Italy. Uh, so Chris Vickers wants to make his day uh, a little bit better as he lines up Biazzito heading down into turn one. Will he have a look? He gets close. Maybe into two, he can look for the older uh, flip-flop, but he won't be able to find it. Yeah, he seems very strong into turn one there. His entry into that corner is absolutely phenomenal, and he nearly hits the back of the Lexus almost every time he goes into that corner. Um, thankfully, he's been able to refrain from doing that, but he's so close to the back. He's just not quite fast enough where he needs to be as uh, Jimmy Wim Hansen is into the pit lane uh, in the McLaren, the lone McLaren number 12 there so john clements has already completed one of the passes he needs to in this race and uh, meanwhile chris vickers still applying the pressure here once again can he get down the inside into nine and ten he has been strong into here as well is he going to make the late dive down to the inside not quite he sticks his nose in there he, he lets Biazizo know that He's in the mirrors and it forces the Italian wide. And now it looks like he's going to try and get himself alongside down here into 11. But that Lexus looks very good in a straight line indeed. Uh, into Corvone we go. It's still Biazzito from Chris Vickers in the battle for P11. And uh, I think Biazzito had a little bit of a moment as they make their way uh, through turn 13 and down into 14. That's going to be Chris Vickers down the inside. Has he got the job done? Because Biazzito tries to hold it around the outside. There's more contact between the two of them. Chris Vickers almost faces the wrong way, but somehow he saves a car and the pair of them. They're still side by side as they make their way into the final corner, Ewan. What a save that was from Chris Vickers. I felt for sure that he was going to go around, and this has allowed another three cars into this battle, just making things even more complicated now. Philip Mapsik is the watching brief in this one. The Aston Martin, very good, into turn one once again, but he can't make it work, and they've both gone off almost. The Lexus goes way off there, appears he's though, and now Mapsik's going to try and get both of them. He's going to try and get down the inside of his teammate, maybe, here into turn five, and he's got that done. Wide from Biazito again allows Vickers through, but the uh, preceding Lexus has Biazito gone off wide. as well. Now look at uh, down the inside. It, Carl Likegaard is trying to get involved. This is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy is one way to put it, Ewan, for sure. But Chris Vickers squeezes Biazito wide, and now Biazito tumbles down the order. But Vickers wants to keep on going because he's got rid of one Butler Palmer sport car, but he's got the other one right in front of him again. 
Yeah, it must be really quite soul-destroying for him at this point, just seeing the back of the same Butler Park, well, not the same Butler Park car, but the same design on that Lexus he's just staring at for the last 10 minutes. He always gets a good run out of 10, and it seems to be an Aston Martin thing, actually, because Lycagon just did the exact same thing on Biazizo, but... They all run into turn 12, uh, 11, 12, and 13 now in the braking zone at 14. This is where the action all kicked off last lap around. Is Vickers going to go for it again? Not quite. Lightning isn't going to strike twice, although he is really applying the pressure and always applying, applying a bit of physical pressure, actually, there onto the rear bumper of the Lexus. Yeah, very, very close now in this battle for PA. Matsik, or oh, pardon me, Matsik and Vickers, and then Bietzito and Leikegaard for P10. That final points position. And you've got the 112 uh, MBR car as well, just, or oh, pardon me, MSB car, watching all of this unfold and just hoping that something will fall his way. Yeah, in all the madness we saw a lap ago, we didn't actually have time to mention that Alessio Puskedu has got ahead of Marco Pejic for second place at the front of the race. So it's a Mercedes 1-2 here once again with Marco Pejic watching along in third, but he's not getting completely Ooh, someone, distanced by Someone the, ran the, wide. You can see it on the mini-map. Someone these, ran yeah. out wide. I think that was uh, Gelsa. No, it was Biazito. Well spotted there, Ewan. Yeah, he's uh, allowed the Aston Martins to kind of clump together there in uh, three in a row. So we're not entirely sure what exactly happened there, but um, it has kind of split the group in two. And now they're always oh, gone wide again. I wonder if he's having a, a few problems. I don't know if it's uh, to do with the driver or the car, but um, yeah. Bit of a problem. Oh, and that wide again from uh, Gilso. And he's been, uh, well, he got through on like a god briefly. And then went wide, and then he's lost his 10th uh, place once again. So um, a lot of chopping and changing uh, for the lower points at the moment. I think this is really highlighting how difficult, how tough it is here at Misanda to keep it within the track limits and just to keep it off the gravel as well. Especially when you're battling for position, you're pushing that little bit extra and it is so easy to run that little bit wide and make that mistake as you've seen from Biazzito, well, primarily from Biazzito on that last lap. Yeah, it was uh, really unfortunate for him. He's going to make some inroads back to these four, though, because he is very fast indeed, and he's shown at some points to be actually faster than those uh, just in front of him at the moment. But Chris Vickers has still not managed to free himself from the back of a Butler Pal Lexus. And still a little bit surprised to see the Butler Pal cars so far down the order here. I know they're still getting points down the bottom end of the top ten, but... Um, they're a really quite a high-class team, and to see them down here is a little bit surprising. They got a podium at Nürburgring, and uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, if they managed to do it again. I don't think they did manage to do it against Silverstone. They didn't have the greatest race, seventh and ninth for them last time out, but um, they're much more accustomed to running inside the top five, as they did at the Nürburgring, and they've done at previous races like Kyle Army as well. So, um, again, a little bit surprised to see them down here, but I'm sure they're having fun battling with these guys. I'm sure they are, but it's one of those things when, you, when you're when um, you behind the wheel, you're enjoying it. You're secretly enjoying it, but at the same time, you just want to get some clearer. You want to get past and you want to try to catch up to the guys up ahead. And right now, that is uh, Dan Frommel, who is a further five seconds up the road uh, in the Lamborghini. So the Lamborghini is having a decent showing, P3 and P7. Not quite at the levels of uh, the Musto GD Mercedes, but uh, they're having a decent showing nonetheless. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. Uh, that's uh, all that can be said at this point, really. It's not great, but it's not bad either, um, especially from the 59 crew who have had a real torrid second half to the zone. Well, they didn't have a great first half either. They've just had a pretty poor season by their higher standards there at Euronix. They managed a fourth place back all the way at Spa many, many weeks ago in round one. Ever since then, though, they haven't scored a single point and uh, they really deserve to at this point because they're a much better team than languishing outside the top 10. And they're showing it right now with a respectable um, but not uh, completely flattering seventh place. Yeah, Dan Formel doing a decent job as that. Looks like Philip Matzik's run a little bit wide on the exit of a turn at six. And it's going to give Chris Vickers a great opportunity as we make our way down into turn eight. He's going to squeeze his nose down the inside of the Lexus, muscles his way through. And that is Chris Vickers up into P7.
He should be away now as well, but as we saw with that onboard a couple of laps ago, the Lexus is very good in a straight line. So if his exit from turn 10 is good enough, then we could see that uh, Lexus of Philip Matzik come right back to the Aston Martin in front. We'll see if that is the case. It looks like he is going to be way too far back for a heroic dive bomb. And he is going to stick behind for now. We'll see what the pace is like for Vickers. And see if he can even get away from Matic. Or if they, he can make any inroads to from out up in front of him. Well, I was going to say, you and you know, the further back someone is, the more heroic the dive bomb is. And maybe Philip Matic could have had a chance to make a real heroic dive bomb. But um, I guess it there, there's a line before you get from heroic to uh, complete and utter bonkers. Yeah, or, or completely stupid. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. But, um, yeah, it's well, you do look like a hero if you pull them off. However, you do look like the idiot if you don't. Um, and that's the fine line that you walk. Meanwhile, back a little bit further, Carl Likegaard, Michael Gielso, and uh, Alessandro Biazizo are all battling over the final points paying position. Uh, P number 10 and here we go Gilso trying to get down the inside into turn 5 can't do it and in the background we're seeing a little Porsche creeping up on these guys John Clements for Team Rookie Monsters is really starting to play his way back into this race after his drive through penalty on lap 1 and just in case you want, people are wondering how much quicker is John Clements than these guys his fast lap a 35-0 Alexander Biazzito's fast lap 36.6 Michael Gilsa's fastest lap a 37.2 this man is almost two seconds a lap quicker than both of the drivers up ahead and he's going to be looking to get past them as quickly as possible yeah, this is a very important part of the race for Rookie Monsters, getting through the traffic quickly because it is still fairly bunched up. The next five cars are all within about five seconds, which is pretty close. There's not going to be, particularly when you're taking two seconds a lap out of the people in front, five seconds really isn't uh, that much. And the gaps up towards the front of the field don't get much larger either. As round the outside for Biazizo, he's going to try this one on Gielso, who's uh, kind of unintentionally defended um, there. But uh, Biazizu can't get through for the moment. Oh, can he? Penultimate corner. That is audacious. And he's actually trying to make this work. He looks like he will. Final corner. Oh, it's close. It's tight. But Gielso is going to hold on here. And uh, it looks like somebody is missing from the order because this has now become the battle for ninth position. Looking up and down the order, it looks like Frommel might have just disconnected. And I believe that that car is out for Euronix. That's such a shame to see them go from seventh. Yeah, that's the second uh, Lamborghini car. And we were just praising Dan Frommel as well not too long ago for showing a great uh, showing. But Alexander Biazzizzo, well, not so much him getting a good run, but Michael Gelser not having the best of runs. And he runs a little bit wide as well on the exit of uh, turn six. Here comes Biazzizzo through the kink of turn seven. And it's going to have a look down the inside into turn eight. Biazzizzo down the inside pulls the move off for P10. He does indeed. Gilso is going to try and get the cut back and try and get down the inside into turn uh, 9 and 10, but he can't quite, although he sticks his nose kind of down the inside. John Clements is also here now. Tight line off of the corner for the Aston Martin, as always, and he tucks into the slipstream, but the Porsche really is able to hide behind these bigger cars uh, of the Aston Martin and the Lexus. We'll see if Clements is going to make a dive bomb. Here into 14, we've seen the Aston Martin's very good on the brakes so far this session, though. And it doesn't look like that's going to be the case as the Lexus may be trying to get down the inside. Vickers, just, uh, sorry, Likegaard just running a little bit wide. But these four absolutely glued together right now, and it's an absorbing fight. Yeah, but um, I think Clemens has got a lot of water at the ready to unstick himself, at least uh, from Michael Gelser. And let's see if he can pull this off into turn one as Biazzito. He's having a, a little look up ahead. Let's see if he can pull off the move into one. No, he's just a little bit too far back. And that glue, as you mentioned, still very sticky at this point in time. Yeah, difficult to get past for anybody at the moment. Looks like Chris Vickers and Philip Matzik oh, are battling away. Oh, just got... Uh, I think Biazzito oh. just pulled off the move. He's went down the inside, and I he think did. that was a Likegaard running a little bit wide through turn three, and Biazzito was able to get his nose in down the inside into turn four. So great stuff there from Biazzito. And now it's going to be John Clements who searches for a way past. 
He, he is indeed. We'll see if he can manage it. And looks like the Aston Martins are going side by side. Like a god, he's going to lose another position here. Gilso. Oh, and he's come across. He's come across the Porsche. He's going to be in the wall there. I don't think he quite realised John Clements was alongside him. And he's just been tipped into the wall ever so slightly. I don't know how bad the damage is, but it's certainly going to be a damage morale now for Carl Likegaard down in 12th position after that. And John Clements has made a bit of progress, although not in the way he would have wanted. I don't think John Clements can really be faulted for that. I think Likegaard just did not realise Clements was there. And there goes John Clements down the inside. That is an audacious move, but he pulls it off. We talked about the dive bomb down into turn 14. Clements round the outside through 15 and he's got the job done into turn 16 john clements what a move that was fantastic from john clements to get himself into the points once again Gelso really didn't have anything to uh, say back uh, an answer for there because that was just brilliant the dive bomb into uh, 14 and then hanging around the outside through 15 is extremely difficult and he's just managed to do it with ease really up into 10th, and now he's going to run away from the Aston Martins behind him. And whoa, whoa, that's very late on the brakes from Gil, so it was, there must have been some kind of problem for him there, but he somewhat miraculously missed John Clements. He also down to 12th, though, and the, the Aston Martins are going to continue to battle by the looks of this. Yeah, I think they will, but disaster for both a like a guard and a Gilzer. And they drop down to 11th and 12th. John Clements up into the top 10. And now he can hunt down Bietzito. And Chris Vickers and Philip Matzik aren't that further up the road either. No, they aren't. And it's uh, really close down in the midfield and towards the lower parts I think of the Clements top 10. Done it. He's, 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 got, he's got the under ooh. coming out of the right hand. He's got to tuck right in uh, behind Bietzito now as we make our way into turns 11, 12, and 13. Let's see if he can pull off the same move that he did on Kyle Likegaard last lap around. John Clemens makes his way uh, through turn at 12 into 13. Can he look for the inside into 14? Now he's a bit too far back. He is just a little bit too far back on this occasion, but the Porsche seems to be extremely good on the traction, as we've stated before, and the Lexus seems particularly poor coming out of turn th uh, t 10, because we saw the Aston Martin earlier getting great runs off that corner down the back straight as well, but very cl right tucked up behind the rear wing of the Lexus there. John Clements and under braking closes in once again with the Constantina effect. And uh, now into turn five is going to be his next opportunity the right-angled right-hander is uh, he's just too far back on this occasion. He is close and uh, probably could make the dive bomb if he wanted to, but he's deciding that uh, now is not the time and he's just sticking behind for the moment, trying to get the run off this corner here, turn seven, but nothing doing down here into turn eight just yet. Although he was very close here last lap around, not quite close enough once again at this corner. And interestingly, Marco Pejic is falling back and falling into the clutches of John Munro at the front of the race. So it's all going on up and down the field at the moment. John Munro having a great drive for Simply Race at the moment as John Clements gets very close down into turn 10. You talked about how the Lexuses weren't able to get a good runner through turn 10. And it seems like that is a case once again. John Clements tucks right behind uh, the Lexus as they make their way down into turn 11, 12 and 13. Will he be able to find the dive bomb this time around into 14? We'll have to wait and see. We will indeed. It's going to be brave. And he's gone for it again. He sticks the nose down the inside. And he's given the room by Biazizo. And he's got the position there. Even able to defend there to the penultimate corner. He j just showed the nose down the inside. Biazizo was very nice to him, actually. Almost gave him the corner completely. Rolled out the red carpet for him. But Clements is into ninth place. He's going to try and chase down some of those battling cars up towards uh, the higher end of the points. But... Uh, yeah, Beers is uh, very nice to him on that occasion. Could have been a little bit more harsh in his defending, really, but um, it was only a matter of time, to be honest. The Rookie Monsters car definitely looking faster than the Butler Pal for now. Yeah, and I just wonder as well, if um, Bietito left the door open for him, or if he actually ran wide, because I think John Clements would have got that car stopped. I don't know if Bietito knew that, but Clements ran wide, whether that was uh, intentional or... Uh, whether he saw Bietito coming and then thought, okay, you know what, I'll just run a little bit wide just in case, because he ran pretty far wide. So I think he might have just made a mistake himself, did the Italian. 
Well, yeah, it's uh, it's it's difficult to tell really whether he was just breaking late, whether he was trying to do that and stick it out on the outside. But that's a tight corner. You don't really want to be going too wide because there's uh, not much uh, purchase you can actually get from it, and there's not exactly a long straight afterwards for uh, a big run by using that outside line. So, um, if Biazizo was trying to do that, then it's a bit of a poor strategic um call there. As oh, wide. Speaking of going very wide and. Uh, not turning out very well either for Philip Matzik. The teammate of Biazizo has just run wide and allowed Chris Vickers into seventh place. Yep, and we are not even half an hour into the race. Not even a quarter of the way through yet. Chris Vickers up into P7. And let's just keep an eye on John Clemens. Let's see what kind of lap times he's putting out. It was a 36 point, a two for Chris Vickers. Uh, and let's see what John Clemens does when he comes across the line. A 35-0. So over a second quicker than uh, the man in seventh place. Yeah, that battle is going to develop throughout this race. I am sure of that because of the way that Clements has been driving so far. He has the... Oh, Ooh. very, very across the curbs there. Got some severe airtime. Did Philip Matzik and he's... Uh, nearly going to have a concussion after all that because that was severely <laughs> bumpy for the Lexus and these cars not really designed for that as Carl Leikegaard gets a drive-through penalty. Not entirely sure what that is for, but it could well even be for an in-game cut track drive-through uh, as we've seen a lot of that so far tonight or it could indeed be one assigned by race control. Yep, and uh, I'm sure we'll get feeded that information uh, through momentarily and we can clarify for our viewers, but... Like a guard, we'll have to serve that drive through penalty. And um, I think uh, Philip Matzik, well, he might even be scared of flying after that. Yeah, probably. Um, that was really, really, um, really bad. The, the bumps, uh, the sleeping policemen, as you coined them a little bit earlier on. And, and that's exactly what they are, really. It's kind of uh, designed to stop people running from so wide at uh, the final corner as i now have the information uh, it's uh, it was indeed an assigned penalty carl likegaard given a drive-through penalty for contact on lap seven with car 557 uh, that being alessandro Biazizo. can't exactly remember what uh, what the incident was to be honest because so much has happened but he's in anyway and uh, yeah here he goes gonna be uh, seeing where he comes out, probably last at this point, but Hansen has had a long stop already, so uh, I think he'll be out ahead of him. However, he's definitely out of uh, the main battles in this race. John Clements has taken almost two seconds out of Philip Matzik last time round. The gap is now just a four seconds. He is uh, closing on, in on to Philip, hand over fist. And Philip Matzik, he's now the leading Lexus driver on the field, actually down in P8. He is indeed span at turn four. So, uh, yeah, Biazizo was uh, given a, a spin at turn four by Leikegaard. And uh, that is why he has just served that drive through penalty and still serving indeed. Um, not entirely sure if he's... Uh, no, he's just, it's just a very long pit lane. And we'll, we'll highlight this a little bit later on when the pit stops do actually commence. But um, the pit lane through here is pretentiously long uh, and very frustrating, actually, as well um, for those driving it. But... Uh, yeah, at the moment, we're still a little bit away from pit stops. However, we are approaching half an hour. And uh, as we approach that half an hour mark, it means one thing. We've got a very juicy ad break coming your way. And we'll be right back with one and a half more hours of racing action from the GTR 24H Sprint Series. you do but you don't have to worry about that anymore he has a job, son!
Simplexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. There are three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the GTR 24H Sprint Series. It is still the Italians as John Clements. Ooh, I'm glad we caught that. That was a little bit of a sideways moment uh, through uh, turn uh, 13. But John Clements keeps his Porsche on the road as he continues to close in on to uh, Philip Matzik. I also, just, I, I also forgot to mention as well, if you're feeling um, rather chirpy, uh, don't forget you can get in touch with us if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook or Twitch. You can just uh, drop a message in the chat. Otherwise, um, feel free to drop a, treat, uh, a tweet and use the hashtag GTR24H. We'd love to see what tweets you've got, maybe how you're watching the race or um, any other cool stuff you've got to show us. Yeah, indeed. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, ways you can get interactive with us, and uh, we'd certainly like you to. We can get to any questions that you may have, especially if you've not been watching the series so far. Um, we can definitely update you on what has happened and uh, what maybe what we think will happen a little bit uh, later on in this race, or indeed the season as well. For the season finale at Monza in two weeks, which, two weeks sorry, which we will bring to you live as we have done uh, with every race so far. But uh, in this race at the moment, uh, on John Clement's watch at the moment, we are really, because he is romping his way through the field. Um, on the back of Philip Maptic on this occasion, um, and this should be interesting. He's been doing some great dive bombs, and, uh, you know, particularly, uh, or, or usually, we associate the word dive bomb with a kamikaze move down the inside that doesn't often come off and often ends in an accident. However, John Clements has done some of the best executed braking performances I think I've seen in a very long time. Yeah, John Clements has been driving fantastically, and now Philip Matzik, he's just putting himself on a platter. He's adding the ketchup as well. He's drizzling the lemon juice on top as well. And John Clements says, you know what? You look like a very tasty meal. Let me line you up heading down in towards turn one. Yeah, we'll see. He's actually pulling to the inside here on the Lexus, which can be shaky on the entry to corners. However, it looks like Matzik has controlled it well into turn one, where it can be particularly shaky. However, he's gone a little bit wide at turn two. And he's opened himself up to a little bit of an attack down here into turn five. And here we go, the Porsche. It just gets cut across there by Matzik, who once again runs a tiny bit wide into six, but he's able to control himself now into uh, turn seven and the run out of here but, but Porsche gets a good run a big bounce across the curb for the Lexus and he's going to be under severe pressure from the Porsche here into turn eight we'll see if he can get that move done they're equal on the braking side by side through the corner the Lexus hangs it around the outside trying to hold on but Matzik is just going to be shoved out at the last moment there Clements looks like he's got into eighth for now uh, I think he's got the job done as well. That is unless uh, Philip Matzik can get a great run coming uh, through turn 10. But I don't think he's been able to pull it off. John Clements up into P8. And you can see the number 73 of Chris Vickers just up ahead. Only a couple of seconds up the road, actually. Yeah, it's uh, really not far to go. But it looks like Matzik isn't quite done with Clements just yet. However, he's gone very wide there uh, through 11 and 12. And... He's not going to be able to get on terms with the Porsche uh, through these couple of corners here. But um, one interesting thing I did note through that first sector that we saw from the Lexus. Um, uh, sorry, Matzik pretty much nailed turn one uh, for that Lexus, which is pretty poor from what I've seen so far in turn one. It's not the greatest, I have to say. However... He nailed it on that occasion. He really did well to hold on in, in a weak spot for that Lexus. However, the speed he carried caused him to go a bit wide at turn two because um, he kind of outbroke himself. And that set him off course for turn three and four and five and six and seven, which eventually led to the move. So what I'm saying is the first sector really links together. And if you get one corner wrong, then you pretty much screwed up the whole thing. 
Yeah, and actually, John Clements, in that half a lap, from the moment he overtook Philip Matic to the end of the lap, he stretched out about a one-second gap. The gap is now 1.4 seconds, and John Clements is only three seconds behind Chris Vickers. The Porsche man is flying, and we said it. When, as soon as John Clements got that drive through penalty, it's a shame that he's got the drive through penalty, but it means we're going to be seeing some absolutely great racing tonight. Yeah, it does, and we already have done a bit of an overtaking masterclass, particularly on the brakes, and you have to say that that light Porsche, compared to the heavy cars around it, might be playing a little bit of a role there. The fact that uh, Clements has a bit less weight to stop every time they hit the anchors um, than the guys around them, because the Lexus and the uh, Aston Martin and uh, the Bentleys that Clements might even get to a little bit later on, noticeably bigger and therefore probably heavier um, than the uh, cars around. Although the BOP does negate a little bit of that and allows bigger cars to be competitive in that way and, and provide some great uh, racing for us, as, as I keep mentioning, the uh, kind of ebb and flow and the different strengths and weaknesses of these cars making racing so interesting. Um, and that's what we're seeing at the moment with Clements just closing on Vickers here. I believe it's about three seconds at the moment. It is 3.0. Um, and let's see the lap times last time around, just so we can get an idea. 36.0 for Vickers and a 35.7 for Clements. So the uh, the point at which, or the speed at which he's catching these cars is getting a little bit smaller every single time. And that suggests, um, obviously, it naturally suggests he's getting closer to the field because he's he's finding it harder to catch and pass cars with each car he does pass. Yeah, but I'm sure he'll be able to pull off the move pretty soon. John Monroe closing in onto Marker Page. That gap has been around one second for, I think, the last 20 minutes or so. But in 20 minutes or so, we're going to be getting those driver changes coming through and we'll make our way into the second half of the race. And it means we will be seeing the likes of Tiziano Brioni coming out for one of the Musto cars. Uh, Trevor Jackson will be replacing Alessio Puschetto. And of course, Leon Otoki jumping in for Marco Pech and Ross McGregor in for, for John Monroe. Yeah, indeed. There's going to be some driver stops uh, a little bit later on in this race. Probably, actually, the window for that actually opens in about 10 minutes time, actually, with the uh, amount of time that these cars can actually spend out there. Um, not entire, We haven't really been able to work out which is the most few hungry of the cars. However, we did figure out back at the Hungara Ring uh, many, many weeks ago in a great race um, that the uh, Lexus was very, very fr uh, frugal on its uh, fuel indeed. So, um, yeah, expect them to stay out for a long time. However, there's no Lexuses really uh, battling for the race win. And it seems like it's only Musto cars battling for the race win at the moment. Eight seconds separates the two teammates. And then you've got a further 11 back to Marco Pejic. So um, although he was able to stick with the Italians to start with, Pejic has really fallen away now. And I'm just taking a quick look. Ewan, when do you think was the last time Musto had a 1-2 this season? Well, I never. I, don't, I didn't think they actually had. Exactly. They've had a 2-3 at Zolder. They've had a 2-3 at Hungary. And that has been the only times they were both on the podium, from what I can see here. Just those two races, set two seconds and thirds. Aside from that, they've never been on the podium at the same time. And now... They've got a chance to do a 1-2 at their home circuit. And at the race where Pierluca Amato and Tiziano Brioni will wrap up the Sprint Series Championship. They've already got the championship. It doesn't matter what they could do. They could, um, you know, head down into turn 14 and just drive flat out into a wall and, you know, retire from the race. And they'd still have the championship wrapped up. Yeah, obviously they were probably not going to do that given the, uh, the no. race that win that's on the line here. Uh, and that would be, uh, it would be still great for them to get that race win. And I'm sure they're going to try and do that. Um, so uh, they're not going to be driving into any walls anytime soon. But uh, certainly they have got this wrapped up at the moment. Currently on 160 points coming into the day. They're probably going to break 200 by the end. If they take this race win at a third next time out, then they'll break 200 points out of 12 rounds. And uh, they really do deserve this, this championship, you have to say, only coming off of the podium. At Bathurst and the Nürburgring, all of the other races, uh, and Brands Hatch, and where they came fourth, which is not half bad, but uh, only not finishing one race and uh, being a lot more consistent than the others. Burst Esports were looking formidable earlier on in the season, 
However, they really fell off towards the end, uh, including, well, really starting back at Kyle Army. Ever since then, for the final five rounds, they have really not been the same. Yeah, and um, but Steve, yeah, they just completely dropped off. But, but Musto, Bathurst, again, no fault of their own. They got taken out. And um, yeah, uh, that's the reason they didn't get any points. I think they finished P14 or something. They just couldn't recover after having a lot of repairs they had to make. And then Nürburgring, well, I think that was probably my favorite race of the season, watching Tiziana Brioni. It feels, it feels like a horrible thing to say, but watching Tiziana Brioni be involved in a spin within a lap, catch back up, overtake, be involved in a spin, and then do the whole thing again about three or four times was very, very entertaining. It, well, it was entertaining for the fan. I, I, I agree with that, but for the actual... Uh for the actual drivers involved then i can imagine it wasn't quite so entertaining and probably very frustrating actually for brioni ending up oh, in yeah. fifth position um, but you have to say that they were pushed into that by a poor strategic decision that they made earlier on in the race so despite the uh, the driving which is a little bit questionable the tactics were also quite questionable throughout that race and that was one of the only two occasions we have seen rain so far this season the other time being kyle army where the race started uh, pretty damp, well, I'll say damp, pretty torrential, actually. Um, and then uh, yeah, later on, it dried up and uh, made for a very exciting race. Nürburgring was the other way around, um, and it was equally exciting. Um, so, yeah, we waited a very long time for the rain to come, uh, and it didn't disappoint. Unfortunately, though, it did disappoint Brioni on that occasion. Yeah. Well, um, Brioni, he learned from that. He came back stronger at Silverstone. They took the win, you know, arguably, if it wasn't for that bad strategy call, they would have been able to take the win at Nürburgring as well. Remember, it was Manuel Biancalila who jumped in the car just for 15, 20 minutes on the dry tires in pouring wet conditions. And he, I don't know how he found the grip. I know it said on the game that it was uh, greasy, but um, either way, Manuel Biancalila did an absolutely fantastic job for Musto nonetheless. And um, it was still enough to get Musto some decent points and a, um, a fifth place back at the German track. Yeah, they did indeed. And uh, I wonder, uh, I've just thought of a bit of a conspiracy of my own, actually, whether Ooh. they actually, um, well, it's not much, I'll, I'll see what you think to it, because uh, last time I came with one of these, it was dreadful. Um, but uh, we've, got a, we've got a little bit of time to talk about it, I suppose. And um, what if they actually didn't, that wasn't a strategic error, they actually planned to go out on the drives again, just so that Bianca Lula could get some driving time in, because you do have to make a driver swap in this series, however, I don't believe there's a minimum amount of laps, it might, it, well, either, either if there is, uh, it's not very many, um, so that, were they able to just plan that, get Bianca Lula in for a couple of laps, and then uh, get him out again, because he wasn't feeling that comfortable, or if, or just he didn't want to be in there for a, a whole hour stint or an hour and 20 stint, which was what it would have been. Uh, he was able to cope perfectly fine on the drive. So what if they just sent him out there for 20 minutes as a kind of plan just to get his driving time over and done with and get the more experienced, uh, at least to the sprint series here, because Brioni has been around all season. Um, Brioni would be more experienced at this series. And so they let him drive most of the race. I like the conspiracy, Ewan. I just have one slight issue with that. And, I mean, maybe it is the case, but um, I feel like it'd be slightly yikes from Musto if they decided, hey, we've got an inexperienced driver. Okay, we want to give him some track time. How do we do it? Let's put him out in wet conditions on the slick tyres. Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe, a good... Well, maybe they yeah. went for it, but... That is a good point. It's not the ideal place you want to be learning uh, a new track. Well, not, not a new track, but an unfamiliar series in a possibly unfamiliar car and a possibly unfamiliar game. You probably don't want to be doing that, no. Um, although, uh, yeah, it's, it, that's, that's a pretty good point. Although, yeah, the, the uh, drives and the wets were pretty equal in performance at that point, but that doesn't mean it wasn't quite sketchy to drive. Yeah, I, I, I agree. However, Biancalula is not a... Uh, a, a a, a kind of newbie, uh, a new driver in terms of sim racing. Oh, no. Uh, and he's not a bad driver either. So um, I think they trusted him to cope with that. And he did in the end. Well, he's a pretty good driver. I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, he's in F1 Esports as well. Or he was in as a reserve driver last year, I think. Although I may be mistaken. I think he was in... Um... 
he was signed up for Toro Rosso, if I'm not mistaken. So um, definitely a driver with a lot of sim racing experience and a very high caliber as well. But this week, it's no Manuel Biancalila, it's Pierluca Amato. Actually, I mean, we don't know. It could be Manuel Biancalila awaiting us, but we expect it to be Tiziano Brioni for the Mosto car. And uh, I guess going back to conspiracy theories, do we reckon that um, the Mosto A team will let the Mosto B team through to get them extra points and uh, help them try to secure that fourth place in the championship? I personally doubt that now, given the situation on the road, because we've got 10 seconds separating the two Musto cars at the moment. Um, as you can see at the top left, it's, it's a big gap, and it's a lot of slowing down that Amato is going to have to do to let his teammate through. Um, and as I said a little bit earlier on, I don't know how bothered these guys are going to be about fourth position. I know we're bothered about it, because it is strangely fascinating uh, 23 simply race up there with uh, marco page is up there his car 58 98 there 556 five, also involved so of course sim sport there uh, in the running as are the next couple of cars simply race sancho 370 uh, also there so that's that's a good few cars you know, of course that those simply race sancho guys aren't here today but those uh, those few cars very involved in a very tight battle for fourth position, and uh, it seems that, well, in my experience of the F1 point system, anyway, that's what we're basing the points yes. off here uh, for the sprint series, is that um, these battles for lower positions in the championship can get very close and very exciting indeed, as Chris Vickers has just let John Clements through there. Not entirely sure why, but I was looking forward to a battle between those two, but Vickers has just pulled wide and let Clements through. I guess Vickers just knew that Clements was going to get past him sooner or later. He must have been seeing um, John Clements catching up hand over fist these past few laps and just thought, why slow myself down? I'm not racing with John. I just want to make sure that oh. I can keep my gap to Matic. Amato is gone. Amato's gone. Amato is not even in the race anymore. I'm not entirely sure why, but uh, he's disconnected completely. And uh, we're down to 12 through no fault of their own, I don't believe. So Pisquetto is leading. And they have let him through, I guess. But, um, <laughs> they have. Yeah. He's, uh, he's out of the race completely. That's big drama and a big shame as well. I believe there's a specific song that would be very um, appropriate here. Another one bites the dust. <laughs> yes. No. Um, yeah, to be honest. That's three was now. That, yeah, our third. I was thinking, was that three or four? Yeah, but, well, um... we saw one in qualifying for the 57 then the 58 in the race that was down to 13 and now um the 71 gone championship leaders and championship winners um are going to be crowned champions next round at monza but uh, completely gone in this race that's a, a real big shame but it shuffles everybody up a position that's one way to take your title isn't it <laughs> yeah by not even um driving really but uh yeah they're still going to hopefully get there. It's going to be a bit of a two-hour lap of honour for them next uh, next time at Monza, really. Um, not much to race for, but apart from the race win, of course, which I'm sure they'll want, but um, not much riding on that race at the end of the season next time so, out. Ewan, you remember that stat, the statistic I was telling you about the last time Musto got a 1-2? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's out the window again. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think it's gone now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, it is um, completely gone. It, those uh, two positions were re reversed when they finished two and three. At uh, one time, it was the 71 in front, and the other time, it was the other car. Um, but uh, yeah, none of them, neither of them managing to get a one two. Uh, I'm going to have a look and I'm going to check this, but I don't think a team has had a one two this season at all. No, I don't believe so. I think the only other team that could have done it would have been um, Euronix. Burst have two cars as well, but um, that they've I don't think that other Burst car has actually got a teammate or, or, or a podium at all, never mind being on the podium with their actual teammates, the number 95 and the 94. Yeah, the 95's best result is fifth place last time out at Silverstone. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, no team has managed to get a 1 2. Euronics have got the biggest points haul of any team, which was a 1-3. That was back at the Nürburgring. They couldn't quite make a 1-2 thanks to a very fantastic drive from John Munro and, and Ross McGregor in the Simply Race Car. They took P2. Um, Euronics, they have also... Well, have they also got any other, anything else? No. That was the only time two Euronics cars were on the podium. 
Um, are you sure that uh, the 58 finished third at Nürburgring? Because I've got them down as fourth um, on, uh, uh, on yeah. both of mine. I so can't that, read. It's that. <laughs> Spencer Hale's great math skills once again. Ah, uh, right. Well, uh, that, that would actually still be a bigger points haul than a 2-3. Um, so uh, you still might be correct, um, even, even so. But... Um, yeah, obviously, when they've got three cars, I know the 59 hasn't been scoring very well, but when you've got three cars, the likelihood of you actually getting that biggest points haul of the weekend is quite likely, as Marco Page now looks to be coming under increasing pressure from John Munro. Luca Burke, the first of the cars to pit, apart from Hansen, who came in a little bit earlier on, but um, I think that was unscheduled. Um, so this battle really now commencing for P2. And uh, it really is best of the rest now. Musto in a league of their own. However, Payich versus Munro is really going to be the defining battle for the rest of this race, I think. Yeah, Luca Burke in the pits as well. We'll see where he feeds out. Of course, everyone else will be making their stops within the next 10 to 20 minutes or so, we assume. But the battle for P2, uh, or I guess the battle for the final podium spot as well in one sense. Lamborghini versus Bentley. And uh, let's see if Bentley can get themselves up or one step higher on that podium. Yeah, I'm impressed, by the way, with the performance of the Lamborghini. It's a bit of a punt for a big team like Euronics to go for an un, uh, untrusted and untried car. Is into the pit lane. Comes Marco Pech. He's going to hand over to Leon Otoki, who has been starting the car quite often throughout this season. However, Pech has decided to take the race start on this occasion. And uh, now I'm gonna, just going to switch the... I don't know if we're actually looking at this on the stream, but... Uh, oh, uh, never mind, I've missed it. Um, Luca Burke has, has swapped over for Dan Kell, and he's come out right behind uh, Michael Gilso, I believe. Um, no, no, sorry, that, he's in an Aston Martin, so it can't be him. He must be getting lapped by John Moreau, maybe. Um, yes. They're down to turn one, so the teammates are running uh, nose to tail. However, they are a lap apart. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, try and catch this. It is on... a fairly long pit stop, though. Um, mm, yes. I mean, it's not a lap, but I think when the pit stop is made, it'll be about 40 seconds behind or something like that. Yeah, quite possibly. I'm trying to catch this, so uh, b bear with me uh, for this, uh, by the way. Um, I'm trying to demonstrate just how long this pit lane is. and The pits, pit times are going to be quite long here because of this pit lane, which I'm trying to demonstrate. So you'd think you'd maybe get off the pit limiter about here, because that's where the pit lane bays exit, really. And on the right-hand side at the moment, you've got cars tearing down into turn one and two and, and three, where you actually exit the pit lane, but you're still hanging on here. It must be a good 12 seconds between actually exiting the, the where the actual garages are and releasing the pit limiter, which is all the way down here. Not entirely sure why they hold them for so long, but uh, there you have it. That's why the pit lane uh, and the pit stop times take so long here, because you're just pointlessly hanging on to the pit limiter for about 20 seconds longer than you need to. The now, um, Circuit Jules Villeneuve are going to get the same idea and make their pit um, exit line so much later. And maybe that is the reason why they have it so late at Misana, just because otherwise you do gain a lot of time because you're essentially cutting through um, the chicane, the, the park chicane of turns one, two, and three. Yeah, it's uh, a bit like the, the Silverstone as well in that sense. So the pit lane yeah. is on the inside of the circuit. Well, the pit lane isn't on the inside of the circuit here. However, you do gain time um, from it, which is a bit of a strange one to work out in your head. But when you look it's, at the track yeah. map, it does make sense. Um, yeah, so it's, this it's the same as Canada, isn't it? Just I, th yeah. I think you gain you probably gain the same amount of time as you would in Canada if you weren't under a pit limiter, to be honest. It, it's pretty similar in its layout, really, but um, I know that sounds a bit strange to say, and, 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 and trying to work it out in your head is uh, pretty... Um, well, yeah, it's, it's quite... It doesn't really make sense, but if you look at a track map, you, you know what we're on about. Um, oh. Hopefully, anyway... Oh, as... we, we've, got a, we've, got, we've got a little trick, Ewan. Oh. There, there, oh. there's a track map oh there you go yeah, yeah. We don't, well, it doesn't show you where the pit lane is but you can kind of see um because of the uh, kind of the check of like where the start line is so um yeah there you go i didn't know we could pull a track map up well i did know that i forgot um as john monroe exits the pit lane and uh, he has handed over to ross mcgregor he's handed over that car well ahead of leon otoki he's just got out ahead of hansen there but there's laps between them so ross mcgregor is in a great position now with that overcut he has made on a toki you've got to think that there's some kind of disparity in the amount of time they've had to spend stationary because that is a big margin and surely that can't have been made up in one outlap or in lap 
Well, John Monroe was definitely catching up to Mark Page, so it must have been an absolutely stellar outlap as well uh, from uh, um, John Monroe, and maybe Leon Otoki didn't have the best of outlaps himself, so yeah, it could be a number of things. Also, don't forget, it's Bentley versus Lamborghini, so maybe the, the Lamborghini is that little bit more thirsty on fuel. Quite possibly, and uh, he's had to just spend a little bit longer uh, stationary filling up that car. And we're going to get a gap between those two in just a minute. It's five seconds. It's just under that. And Toki is going to have to chase down. However, McGregor comes across a bit of a problem here in the form of Alessandro Biazizo in front of him. Italian driver for Butler Pal. He's really going to be... I keep calling him Italian. He's actually German on our data sheet, I believe. Um, so I apologise if I've actually been... Um, you call him the wrong nationality for this whole time. I'll just refrain from doing that so I don't get it wrong for the rest of it. But um, Pit Stop's really uh, coming into force here. And Piers Izzo and Matzik are going to get out of their Butler Pal cars soon. Uh, Matzik is going to be handing over in that 556 to Johannes Weiss. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's going to be uh, handing over there. And uh, unsure how well he's going to go, of course, but we'll find out sooner rather than later. And the race leader, Alessandro Puskedu, is into the pit lane, handing over to Giannelli Primavera, we'd assume. Yep. As uh, Ross McGregor getting very close to the back of uh, um, Alexander Biazzizzo, down the inside he'll go into a turn eight, and the Italian doesn't uh, make things uh, too difficult. They, um, as I say that, it looks like he has a little think about holding around the outside, but Ross McGregor will have the job done. He nearly managed it, actually, and tried to get back down the inside into 10 there, so um, interesting that he did go for a, a second bite of the cherry, maybe, but uh, I think that was uh, Ross McGregor pulling out towards the right there just to show his discontent, actually, with the uh, amount of fight that was put up there, but in, in retrospect, it was actually quite nice. Um, there was Bezizo. So he's probably going to be into the pit lane at the end of this lap, uh, as nearly all of the cars have been so far. Only Rookie Monsters really going for a real long first stint here. Everybody else is wanting to pit well before the hour so that uh, they can get their drivers sort over and done with and get through the rest of the race um, all cleanly as Bezizo does come in now. Um, Puskedu leaves the pit lane already, so he's going to restore his 20-odd second lead, although it might have shrunk ever so slightly. Uh, as he moves down to four, uh, third, sorry, but uh, yeah, order has been restored, uh, sort of, with the, still only the Rookie Monsters cars to pit. Also, you remember how you were saying, Ewan, about how Chris Vickers just pulled out of, the, out of the way of John Clements? Yeah, I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, but... it was uh, Team Rookie Monsters uh, orders. I, I just spotted it in the YouTube chat now. Oh, very, very, we are very, very observant, actually, figuring that out. Um, about half an hour after it happened. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm pretty disappointed with myself, I have to say. I, yeah, so, so I just saw Tiziano Brioni in the green room for a moment there, but he's gone yeah. again. Um, so that's a shame. Bye, um, Tiziano. But, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I thought we were going to get a mid-race interview there, and he's going to tell us what happened, but unfortunately he hasn't. If he's still listening and still uh, around, then we'll, we'll try and get him in after after the break we're about to have here, because we're about to hit an hour. But uh, yeah, if, if Brioni wants to... Uh, Get, get back in there and get a mid-race interview just to tell us what went on there, then um, that'll be uh, that, that'll be very nice. But yeah. as I said, we are approaching the hour mark now. Just over an hour to go in this race. When we return, there'll be less than that. But either way, you're watching the GTR 24H Sprint Series from Mazzano, and the second half of the race is coming up after this. Okay, I'll be a bit. Okay.
games? Do you like esports? Do you hate watching laggy streams of tournaments on 13 inch screens? Oh my god! Of course you do. But you don't have to worry about that anymore. He has a jump, son! Oh Simplexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. Their three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, apologies, we're having a slight technical issue, which does mean we can't be showing you the live image. So, that means myself and you and O'Leary, we're going to be having a slight change in career path. We're no longer doing TV commentary. We're doing a bit of radio commentary, aren't we, Ewan? Uh, it does look like that for the moment. It's about to get very difficult because Dan Kell and uh, Johannes Weiss have been having the best battle um, pretty much of the race so far. And it's a shame that uh, nobody's really able to see it at the moment. Uh, the, Dan Kell trying to hang it around the outside. He's been trying to get ahead of this Lexus for ages. Um, and he nearly managed it at turn 10 last lap around, diving down the inside, but went too deep into the corner. The Lexus was able to get the cutback and the move um, or, or the, the repass done. Um, so uh, Vice is still ahead of uh, Kel, and both Rookie Monsters cars have been in during the break as well. Chris Vickers is in sixth, but he's actually jumped Matt Beavis um, in, uh, for sixth position there, I believe. Um, so, uh, yeah, change around in Rookie Monsters somehow as uh, the images are back on the stream, which is uh, very good and very good timing because the battles are really starting to commence, both for both Rookie Monsters cars and that battle for eighth position going on a little bit further back. But uh, yeah, it's all very interesting, all going on at the moment. Team Rookie Monsters might have to um, pull out the old multi-3773 again. Um, that is, if Matt, v Matt Beavis is able to run quicker than Hinsai in his Porsches. Once again, well, there it is. Matt Beavis sweeps past Hinsai, who I don't think is going to put up a, too much of a fight. They're side by side in the run down towards a turn 11. And down the inside will go Matt Beavis, but Hinsai is still there, and Hinsai holds on to the position. Yeah, the outside, surprisingly, uh, worked out very, very well there for Hinsai, and he's able to hold on further back. It looks like Dan Kell's going to maybe attempt another move here to turn 12. He's going up the inside, but these sweeping corners are not conducive to uh, mad overtaking. Um, or, or a lot of overtaking anyway it's conducive to mad overtakes um, which we've seen so far but Dan Kell can't execute one of them at the moment trying to get down the inside maybe or, or even down to the outside at the penultimate corner but he's not looking to find a way through at the moment because he can't find a way through right now just bouncing across those curves which are a little bit less aggressive than those on the exit of turn 7 but equally annoying for these drivers and now down towards turn number one, where there are more sausage curves placed in inconvenient places. Oh, those beautiful sausage curves. Uh, you just like to uh, chip away at them as you drive. Get yourself a little, a little meal. I'm sure you get a bit hungry in the car. Um, also want to give an update on the battle for P2. Leon Otoki last time round, half a second quicker than Ross McGregor. The gap is uh, currently at, uh, I believe it's around a fourth second. So... Liam is going to be chipping away at that slowly but surely. He is indeed. Matt Beavis, meanwhile, has got up in front of his teammate Hinsai for sixth position. And now you'd have to expect him to run away uh, as uh, up the road. And that is going to turn into fifth position when Marco Gilso goes into the pit lane. He still hasn't pitted yet for that Aston Martin. Uh, he's going to be handing over there 
in the 1-2-2 um, to somebody else, uh, which I'll find in, in a moment, but uh, I can't seem to at the moment. Jacob Anderson is going to be his, uh, his uh, partner for this race. Now lives in Denmark after um, being uh, born in Wales and raised in London. The uh, man of... Uh, seems to not stop moving uh, at the moment he's going to be handing over uh, there to uh, Anderson and uh, we'll see where those guys can get up to but Vice and uh, Dan Kell look like they're battling pretty hard at the moment and Dan Kell might have just dispatched of Vice in a way that uh, is not quite within the rules because Vice is suspiciously far behind now and he's actually back with his teammate Schaefer Yep, and uh, Schaefer's uh, just uh, passed him there temporarily as well. Well, we'll see if it is temporary or not, as uh, I'm sure Weiss will be uh, keen to make the move back and uh, climb back up the order. Of course, this is big as well because there's a bit of a battle going on in the championship between the number 15 Simply Race Car and the 557 Butler Pal Motorsport Car. Four points separating them, Simply Race on 17 points. So. They want to get as many points as they can and if it finishes like this they'll be looking in a very solid position heading into Monza because don't forget these are two teams as Johannes Weiss he wants to get a bit of airtime as well but the number 15 and the number 557 are cars aren't cars that usually get a lot of points so that four point gap that it currently exists is a pretty large gap for these teams. Yeah, it is particularly when you're fighting down here towards the bottom of the order. But if you're wondering why Dankel is so far back, it's because he had a drive-through penalty while we were away at the break. Not entirely sure what it was for, but he served it immediately, which suggests to me that it might have been um, to do with the game and not assigned by one of our race control stewards. As uh, Gilso finally comes in to hand over to Anderson. Um, and he's going to be a little bit further back when once that does happen and Dunkel probably going to be into seventh but maybe not we'll find out when that Aston Martin exits the pit lane um, but uh, yeah Kel is a little bit further back than what he was beforehand just because of that drive through he had to serve and so now he's uh, unfortunately all the way down there in eighth and he's going to make a little bit of progress later on in this race however he did lose a second to uh, Hinsight on that particular lap. Now, where has Gilso come out? Doesn't look like he has come out of the pit lane just yet. So, seventh place for Dan Kell. There is Jacob Anderson jumping into the MSB racing car. He's going to fall behind Dan Kell and uh, Richard Schaefer, as well as Johannes Weiss, who should come out in P10 ahead of uh, Steven Salzgort. And uh, he, we'll have to see whether he can close the gap there to the Butler Power Motorsport cars. Yeah, those running in 8th and 9th at the moment. And the closest battle is between the two Rookie Monsters cars. The greatly recovering 37, of uh, which John Clements did most of the work earlier on in this race, putting on a bit of an overtaking masterclass. But Matt Mewis is going to have to do a lot of closing in if he wants to take a, uh, a great hold on, this, uh, on that fourth place that's currently held by Simon Crane. He's going to need to close a nearly 30 seconds. Um, it's probably closer to 25, but he's still going to need a lot of time if he wants to get fourth away. And I can't see him closing that margin without help um, from maybe a crane mistake um, or, or indeed some kind of incident along the way because you don't often close in that kind of margin purely on pace. Yeah, unless your name is uh, Tiziano Bioni or um, <laughs> Timmy Arshaw. Uh, or either of their teammates that being said also I think we've just got confirmation in the YouTube chat as well John Munro letting us know that the drive through penalty for the number 15 car was due to track limits so um, it was not one that was uh, given by the stewards and uh, Dan Kell can uh, now begin his redemption arc as one might say 20 seconds to get between himself and his a teammate or pardon me between himself and Hind Sai I'm just trying to look at what their last laps were. Dan Kell 37.3, Hinsai 35.9. So Dan Kell dropping back at the moment. Yeah, it's a little bit surprising to me, but um, let's not forget that Luca Burke may well just be faster in that car than uh, Dan Kell is at this present moment. Um, because really, we've, we were seeing that 15 do very well earlier on, running up in P5 it was, ahead of both Rookie Monsters cars, and it looked like it was pretty consolidating that position however Dan Kell might not have quite the pace that Luca Burke does in that car and that's a little bit surprising but um, yeah still seventh place for those guys at the moment and uh, the only closing gap really 
and one that's likely to develop into a battle is Leanna Toki and Ross McGregor. The Toki doing a lot of the heavy lifting right now. The gap didn't close at all on the last lap, but it may well do on the next one. We'll find out. But uh, it was five seconds when they both came out of the pit lane. It's now down to four, so it is slowly coming down. But if, if he wants to actually get a good go at overtaking here, he might want to close in a little bit quicker than he is doing right now. Oh, don't worry, Ewan. We've still got 47 minutes left, and that equates to something around 30 laps here at the Misano. So still got a while yet for Leon Otaki to close in on to Ross McGregor. And uh, I'm sure he'll slowly start to chip away. Either way, at the moment, it looks like we're going to be getting three different manufacturers in those top three positions. Mercedes, Bentley, and Lamborghini. And Lamborghini in their first outing here in the Sprint Series. So it's going to be a good day for the Italian manufacturer. It is indeed. And do you want to know when the last time all three, or three different manufacturers got on the podium? It was back at round two at Brands Hatch when Bentley, Lexus and Aston Martin, the three biggest cars, got onto the podium. And incidentally, it happened at Spa as well. But ever since, it's uh, never happened again because most of the field have typically gone for one kind of car and one make of car. However, today, it's the right mix, which is, uh, which is good. Ewan, I have a question for you. Oh, God. How do you find out that stat so quickly? Um, because it's written down right next to me. He, you and he actually, he prepares far more than me. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I only actually write down the results of the top 10 of every race. And that's what's kind of spread across six see, sheets of paper in front of me at the moment. Ah, see, I, I should show you my notes because I've essentially got one sheet of paper with the championship standings. But it's the, um, it's the one that goes out on the GTR 24H website with the cross table of everyone's results. So I've got that all on one sheet with everyone's driver names and then just some notes in the corner and, and the track map. I might nice. have to go for the uh, the multiple um, papers, multiple A4 papers. Yeah, multiple papers. Uh, I'm on to page five at the moment. And after this race, it'll be page six um, with the 11 rounds. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, that, that's how I figure it out. Because obviously when these guys are changing car each, um, in each race, it does make that a little bit difficult to write down and, um, you know, uh, get, get used to, which we're often seeing. But I do actually like this format of changing car each race. It does make things a little yeah. bit harder to follow for the fans, I guess, but it still, uh, it, it makes things entertaining, I think, um, to work out, and it just adds another dimension to it, really. Picking a car is uh, very important in this series, as it might not be in other series, which is um, I think it makes it quite a, a dynamic and, and changing series each, each, uh, each round. Yeah, and uh, I mean, one word that I like to use is the difference between good and exciting. I think it might be more exciting if the teams could only pick like one car for the entire season. That way you get, um, you get drivers being forced to drive a Porsche at somewhere like... Um, Bathurst and really really struggling or maybe having to drive at something with a bit more grunt like that um, Audi or that Mercedes at a tight track like the Laguna Seca and they just really struggle and maybe it's more exciting to see the front runners down the field but oh as Richard Schaefer really has to let off the brakes not to run into the back of Dan Kell through the final corner but back to what I was saying I mean, it might be more exciting, but I don't think it'll be as good as high-quality racing to be able to see the best drivers constantly at the front of the field battling for those wins. As, you know, we've been so lucky to watch the likes of Euronics and Musto do in the past few races. I don't even know if it would be more exciting to be honest, because I think the field would get more spaced out if, uh, if the cars were had to be the same, because obviously those who picked a good car for a certain track uh, and would rise to the front uh, and run away with it, whereas everybody else would be languishing uh, behind a little bit um, further. So, yeah, I really don't know if it would even be that much more exciting um, than it is at the moment. I um, think also you get less team taking you know a pot at, you know the lights that we saw um was it simply racing going with those bmws or you know as we've seen the lamborghini coming out for one of the euronics teams it'd just be a much safer car a car that just works at every circuit and as, as much as i hate to say and you know i hate to say this year i reckon we'll be seeing a lot of bentleys on the field 
we've been seeing a lot of Bentleys and a lot of Audis as well. It'd be almost yeah. a split, 50-50 split. Obviously, some teams further towards the back, like um, like a Garden Salzgard, particularly like the Aston Martin, and so do uh, Anderson and, and, and uh, Gilso. But um, yeah, th there are. It will be mostly uh, Bentleys and mostly Audis. You definitely wouldn't see those uh, brave car choices that we do see. Um, sometimes, although that Ooh, was, wow. oh my goodness, that was an incredible save and some incredible airtime there for Richard Schaefer coming out of the final corner, chasing down Dan Kell, and he is faster, but he is also a bit less consistent. That's twice in a row now, two laps in a row, where he's made a mistake at the final corner and got some pretty big airtime on one of the curbs as well. I think these, uh, I think some of the drivers they found out about some. Um some promotional event that we didn't know about they're trying to get their the their air miles going for maybe some reduced flight tickets to the next land in denmark well yeah quite possibly and they might have stuck some sponsors on the on the bottom of the car so they're trying to get off the air to expose them maybe but uh, <laughs> obviously they're they're not doing that and uh, they're just trying to uh, avoid them as much as possible i do actually like the addition of um, perpendicular sleeping policeman on the exit of uh, corners because you definitely don't see well actually I'm more of a fan of those parallel ones that are quite big and mean that you don't even dip a, dip a wheel off really and it do really does enforce track limits like the one on the exit of uh, La Source at Spa that parallel running one where you really don't see anybody running wide out of turn one at Spa anymore because of that curb um, and that's why I like it really that these perpendicular ones particularly in real life I know in the game these the suspension parts are a little bit more versatile but in real life some of the suspension with some of the driving we've seen so far will be absolutely smashed to pieces if they did what they are doing to this these cars um, at the moment yeah and in real life it won't just be your virtual bottom that's hurting it's going to be uh, your real bottom that will be rather painful as uh, Richard Schaefer wants to get right up onto the bottom of Dan Kell it seems it does indeed. Very, very close between these guys at the moment. Dan Kell not looking the most comfortable we've seen him so far this season. Richard Schaefer not looking too bad in that Lexus at the moment. Going for seventh position. I don't know if he's going to be able to get any more than this now. With the Rookie Monsters being so far in front as they are right now. Um, it's nearly, it, well, it's about 25 seconds, but... Um, either way, he's going to want 7th place here is Schaefer, and he might just get it down here into turn 8. Pulls to the inside for the hairpin, and it's a long way round here for Kel. But the flowing nature of the corner does con uh, conduce some uh, good uh, running around the outside. However, he's gone for the cutback on this occasion, and he's actually let that position go. Schaefer now in front, but Dan Kel looking for the inside manoeuvre once again. Schaefer had to defend, and now it looks like Kel's going to get a good run, run off 10. the corner. Yeah, he's got a really good run through 10, and I think he's pulled the position back. Dan Kell back up into PA. Great driving from Dan, and, uh, well, he's going to be fighting Schaefer tooth and nail for this position. He is indeed, but it looks like finally Schaefer might Ooh, well have... Whoa, that's a big outbreaking of the corner there by Dan Kell, and he is really struggling out there at the moment not looking himself neatly clattered into the back of Schaefer there and that I could have been he, huge I think he got caught out by Schaefer I think Schaefer had a moment clipped the inside curb and uh, Dan Kell had to take avoiding ac action and went wide I'm not sure if I missaw that but that's what it looked to me on my screen yeah it was certainly a big big moment and a good save actually from Dan Kell there but look who is in the background at the moment it's Trevor Jackson in the Musto Mercedes for number 98 currently leading this race however it is not all plain sailing for musto here amato gave jackson a huge lead uh, sorry not amato it was bruschetti um, who gave him a huge lead coming into this stint however slowly jackson is being reeled in by ross mcgregor two laps ago it was five tenths of a second this time it's only six thousandths but liana toki took five tenths out of both of them and this front three is really closing up as ross mcgregor is beginning to struggle ever so slightly a toki coming into his own and this race at the front of the field is not done yet no it is not a toki slowly closing in the last time round he gained half a second so that gap is a chipping away lap after lap and soon it's going to be within a couple of seconds 3.4 seconds let's see whether leon toki can keep up this uh, pace 
Yeah, we'll see because that Lamborghini really did tail off towards the end of the stint last time out with Lucas Schmidt driving it. Sorry, Marco Pajic uh, driving it. So uh, can Leon Otoki manage those tyres just a little bit better? Only 17 year old, years old is uh, Otoki. That's why possibly we've seen a little bit of an inexperience at the start of races, but he is undeniably fast. And uh, he has... Uh, Ewan, you cannot yes. be referring to the point where they put on slick tyres in the wet conditions at Kyalami, could you? Well, that was not their fault, to be it's fair. The game true, did yeah. put them on dry tyres, despite the fact they selected wets. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 the, I'm thinking more back to Nürburgring, where um, the Toki dived right down the inside of turn. one, well, actually made that work, but got caught up in a few incidents a, a little bit later on in the lap at the hairpin. I think, I believe he was sent spinning around as well um, at the hairpin. So, um, yeah, just, just he's just shown a little bit of an experience at times, but he is undeniably fast and he could develop into a real powerhouse of a driver. Um, if it, maybe, maybe just a bit of a clean up in terms of his, um, you know, in, ter in terms of race, race craft and racing with other cars. But uh, it's, the pace is absolutely there. And uh, that is, that's the difficult thing, the pace, because uh, that can't be learned really. That is talent. That he's showing but racecraft can be learned and that can be worked on and given that he's young he could really turn into a very good driver he, you're making me feel bad now you like are you saying that i can never get fast yes that's exactly what i'm saying i'm also saying that i can never get fast either to be honest because i'm actually so bad i don't even bother competing anymore um let me for, dream for pure embarrassment no, it's not for fear embarrassment i just don't enjoy it to be honest it's much better watching everybody else have a good time up here and yeah. uh we can have a, have a good time watching all the best bits of the race. Um, because if you think about most of these guys at the moment, um, running, particularly if you guys like Jimmy Wolf back at the back of the field, if you have some bad luck early on in the race, you could be running on your own for quite a while. So um, we don't have to do that, and we get to watch all the best battles. That is very true. Very true. I, I always find that after, you know, after watching a really good race, I just want to race myself. But I can't because I'm commentating. So it's it's weird. I I, I want to do both. Is there a, is there a way we can do that? Probably actually. Um, but uh, it, we just uh, need enough commentators for that, which is um, a bit of an issue, especially for 24 hour races. Um, but uh, mm. yeah, we need a commentator's car really. But that I think that'll just be a disaster. Yeah, you you know we just go out, we make things exciting. <laughs> you know when there's nothing happening on track, we just feed out into you know somewhere, make a battle, you know, make someone work for it for a bit. Well, yeah, that doesn't sound like a bad idea at all. That's, um, but, uh, it'll, it'll be bad when I get in the car and miss my braking point and just whack someone out of the race. Yeah, the race leader, yeah. Um, but um, oh, did, are, are we making up conspiracies before they've even happened? <laughs> well, I'm, ju I'm just saying it's uh, it's not going to turn out very well, that's for sure. No. Actually, if we had Cam in the commentator's car, he'd be driving for most of the time because Cam's actually quite good. Um, Cam okay, is so, a good driver. So what we need is we need to do commentary, but all of us commentators, we need to be in a car. We have our own class, which is a commentator class. Oh, Everyone gosh. else can go through us. And we just like whack into each other and oh. we just do bumper cars for 24 hours. Oh, no. Oh, race leader, Trevor Jackson's gone. Trevor oh. Jackson Musto have had an absolute nightmare today. And uh, they, they were going so well, looking on course for a 1 2. But Trevor Jackson looks like he has just disconnected about 20 seconds ago. And that is a real shame for him because uh, Musto at one point looked like they were going to get a 1 2. Then it was looked like Jackson was going to just about hold on to the race lead. And now it looks like it's all gone for them. That is such a shame for Musto. And this means I think we're going to be seeing our fourth different race winner in the form of the number 23 Simply Race Car. We've seen Musto win races. We've seen Euronics win. We've seen Burst win. And we've seen Triple A with the exception of those three teams. From what I can see, no other team has won a race in the GTR 24H Sprint Series. Yeah, fourth different team, fifth different, yeah, fourth, di fourth different team possibly. Um, I believe that, sorry, fifth different team, yeah. Um, with the Musto, Euronix, Burst and Triple Eight. That's not a bad list of teams to win, by the way, is it? That's no. four of the top teams that you could ever imagine to have in your, in your series. And they've all won a race here. So that is, that's a fantastic list of its own. Let's see if Ross McGregor and Simply Race can add their name to that very, very prestigious list indeed.
And Leon Otucky has actually fallen a little bit back from Ross McGregor last time around. Leon Otucky did the same time as Ross McGregor, but the gap is 4.2 seconds. 33 minutes remaining. Leon Otucky is now no longer battling for P2. He's battling for the race win. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to just incentivize everyone here. There's going to be a big battle, I feel. Leon Otucky is not going to let this one go lightly. He did actually get it down to nearly three seconds a couple of laps ago, but maybe just uh, overheated his tyres a little bit trying to close that in. And Ross McGregor is just gently pushing that back out ever so slightly um, by a couple of attempts a lap. Um, and now Otucky is going to have to regroup and try and close in once again, but it's going to be a big battle to the line now. And there's going to be a a very small margin of victory from when Amato was still in the race um, and Puschetto it looks like it was going to be a very big margin of victory but actually it's going to be uh, under five seconds we assume at this point yeah and with simply race picking up the win as well it means that fourth and fifth in the championship will stay simply race and Euronics but I think they will pretty much have uh, fourth and fifth they're guaranteed in some order after Monza but they will be the ones who will finish fourth and fifth yeah they will be separated by seven points because they're tied at the moment on 74 uh, and the number 98 is obviously not going to score any points anymore and that would have really made things very interesting if they'd have won the race and um, then those three cars would be separated by about um, five points probably and that would be very interesting indeed unfortunately Butler Pal 556 are not going to score many here and um, they are going to get six as it stands but it's not going to be quite as, as much. So it looks like 23 and 58 are going to fight this one out for fourth in the championship and for the race win overall here at Mazzano. But we've got just over half an hour to go here. One final ad break coming your way. And then after this, we will be going uh, green to the flag without any ad breaks or blocks or anything. So make sure you join us after that. You're watching the GTR 24 inch sprint series from Mazzano and the final half an hour is coming up in a moment. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He has a jump, son! Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. Their three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization.
welcome back to the GTR 24 8 sprint series here from Italy and Mazzano. Currently, Ross McGregor is leading the race from Leon Otoki and Simon Crane. We've got half an hour to go, and hopefully, in a moment, we'll get an interview uh, with Tiziano Brioni, uh, driver for uh, Musto GD Esports, and he can tell us just what has been going wrong for them in what's been a quite disastrous two hour race for those guys, but it is still me, you and O'Leary alongside Yusuf Bin Sahel once again, and to be only has actually um, moved himself up into the green, but hopefully he can uh, join us here in a moment, and he can tell us what's been going wrong, but uh, I'm afraid it's been a bit of a, a tale of woe for these guys, and he has actually joined us now. Hopefully he can hear us fine, and uh, is is ready to um, talk to us about what's been uh, not not such a good time for Musto. So, um, Tiziano, it's been, as I say, not the greatest race for you guys. Musto, both the 71 and the 70, uh, sorry, the 98, have both um, disappeared from our screens all very suddenly. Um, just what has gone wrong with those cars? Yeah, we suffered of two collection lost on uh, both two cars, so that's it, basically. <laughs> Not a good day for the race, but uh, we won the championship, I think, so it's good uh, from this point of view. Yeah, you did indeed take that uh, take that championship because the 57 weren't able to take the start either. So um, no matter what happens here, you are going to take the championship at the end uh, of this race. Obviously, it will become uh, official uh, next week, uh, sorry, in two weeks time at uh, Monza, but just how was it out, out there in the end? I know you didn't get to drive, but um, what was the uh, what was the feeling from uh, Pierluca and... Uh, get to drive as well. What was, the, what was the feeling from you guys? Were you enjoying your time out there on the Mazzano circuit or, uh, or, or not really? Yeah, we enjoyed so much. Uh, we chose the right car, I think, because the Mercedes was so fast in the track and uh, we did this choice for that and uh, we were the two teams, the only two teams that uh, have chosen that, so car was so fast, uh, Pierre Luca was managing the, the, the race and uh, I will uh, probably take the car to the end but uh, that connection lost uh, mocked us so we hope that uh, we can uh, enjoy our win in Monza but uh, it's a real track and uh, maybe we can uh, have uh, another competition from the other two teams that uh, didn't uh, take part to the race, but uh, maybe they can return in Monza. So we will see next uh, next two weeks. Yeah. Um, I I actually wanted to ask with regards. You mentioned how both Monster cars they picked the Mercedes. Nobody else picked it. Did you ever have? Did you ever consider going with any of the other cars like the Bentley, um, or did you always know it was hundred percent going to be the Mercedes? Uh, into the first uh, five days, I think, because we chose the Mercedes, the Mercedes uh, six days before the race. We tried to set up the Ferrari, the 40, the 488, but it was too hard to drive with the short interaxle, so we lose uh, around four days on the 488 and then we switched to lexus because uh, we thought that uh, was the best car but uh, lexus too had some problems of understeer uh, so much tire degradation uh, hard to go into the corner problems of ride aid so finally we tried the Mercedes and uh, we found a really good car and uh, was a little bit uh, so I was a little bit surprised by by that because it's a very big car so hard to go into the corners but uh, we found a really good car and uh, we found a good setup too and uh, so we were so happy for uh, our choice apart from all 
the final thing that I would like to ask is, I mean, obviously it's a sad day in the sense that both of you guys, you know, you weren't able to finish the race, you're on home so soil here in Italy, but you do win the championship, or at least you and Pierre Luca take it, so, you know, congratulations to you guys for that. Um, heading into Monza, though, what is, you know, what is the approach from you guys going to be? Is it, you know, you're giving 100% going full out and you just want to win by as much as you can, or... You know, do you look to have some more fun? Do you take maybe a not so good car and just look to have more fun battling with people? Uh, basically, we will use the same mindset of uh, hold the championship. So have fun and uh, do the best, and uh, obviously try to win. So we head into Monza with uh, the same uh, mindset, and uh, we will try to do to do our best to get the best result. Yeah, indeed, and uh, we very much look forward to seeing it. Thank you very much, um, Tiziano, for joining us here mid-race. I know it's not been the race that you quite wanted, but nevertheless, thank you very much for coming up and joining us, and good luck for that uh, race at Monza in two weeks' time. Thank you to all. Bye-bye, guys, and uh, thanks for uh, the congratulations for the championship. So have fun for the final uh, part of the race, and uh, good luck to the drivers on the track. Thank you very much. And, Bye -bye. Uh, good to uh, good to oh. get the, a word from the Musto team there, and uh, most specifically Tiziano Brioni, who didn't get to drive in that race, unfortunately. However, while we have been speaking to Tiziano, um, in the final 20 minutes here, as we're approaching, Leon Toki has been approaching Ross McGregor here. Oh, Leon Toki, he hasn't been approaching Ross McGregor. He has been uh, hunting him down. He's engaged his uh, his battle mode he has um turned on his keen hunting nose and he is uh, sniffing a uh, down mcgregor almost a second a lap a quicker last time around was leon Atoki. 35 7 and the fastest man on the track is uh, the Euronix driver he can see ross mcgregor right in front of him he's got 20 minutes that will equate to something around about 14 13 laps for him to make a move on the englishman I think that's enough time, Ewan. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think there is enough time and life left in this race for a big battle for this race lead to come towards the end. I have to admit that a couple of times earlier on in this race, I thought the race for the uh, for the lead was going to be a walk in the park for uh, one of the Musto cars who was in the front. And initially, when Ross McGregor was in the lead, I didn't think Atoki had it in him to actually overtake or, or even get near to the Bentley up in front. But it looks like... He has completely proved me wrong in that respect. The gap is below a second for the first time since pretty much the first couple of laps. The, the gap between first and second, less than a second as we complete lap 62 now. Eight temps it is, and this is going to be incredible. Yep, this is going to be a run right down to the end. A stadium finish for the GTR 24H Sprint Series penultimate round, round 11 at Misano. Ross McGregor, Leon Otoki, two drivers in two teams that haven't seen a win all season or longer. I want to say I haven't seen a second place, but of course, Simply Race picked up that P2 last time out at Nürburgring. And Euronix were able, to, or pardon me, Euronix got a second place in Nürburgring. They also got one back at Spa as well. Simply Race, though, their best result was a P2 as well. Yeah, it's uh, that most of these, both of these guys have been on the podium before, and uh, Ross McGregor, John Monroe have been on here a couple of times actually, because uh, I remember them talking to us, notably at the Nurburgring race. Unfortunately, not quite at Silverstone, but they weren't able um, to get that done. Um, however, we are going to see a great battle between these two, and um, the first. Uh, or, or a different race winner, should I say. The fifth different race winner. We are definitely going to see because no previous race winners are left in the race, which is quite a bizarre thing to say, really, but it just shows how attritional this race has been and a strange coincidence with um, kind of four lightning strikes in one go here with big names being shot out of the... Uh, completely just taken out of the race due to connection issues. And, and we've not seen that all season, thankfully. Um, other than maybe Spa, but there were some issues early on with um, the game and the driver swap, which can be um, that can be put down to. But there's no real game issues or server issues going on here. It's just a, a bizarre situation we've got right now.
Yeah, a very bizarre situation indeed. And can you imagine if uh, Euronix were able to join the race? They might be finding themselves in the lead of the race. 25 points going their way. Musto not getting any. We'd have a championship battle on our hands heading into Monza. But alas, that is not the case. Either way, we do have a battle for the race lead. Ross McGregor, Lino Toki. The gap is just eight tenths of a second. Last time round, Ross McGregor, Ross McGregor was able to pull two tenths from Lino Toki. And just look, three cars and nose to tail. That's the McLaren of Jimmy Wolf getting well out of the way of the 23 and 58 as they make their way nose to tail through turns 9 and 10. Yeah, it's good to see the lap cars have been very well behaved through this, uh, particularly through the second half of the season. We haven't heard Nick Newcomb on the radio telling them to get out of the way, which is normally a good thing. If uh, Nick doesn't have to get on the radio, then uh, it means the uh, lap cars are being well behaved. Um, and so that is good. I was about to say, should I jinx it and mention how uh, Nick Newcomber hasn't been on the radio yet? <laughs> Nick Newcomber, yes, he hasn't been on the radio just yet. He's um, the Newcomber. It's, it's what his name is in the Discord server. It's, it's what we have to call him. And a good sign, actually, as well, is that he's only sent me one message this, uh, this race, which means there's only been one penalty assigned by them. So that's also very good news for the race, as it's been very, very clean. It has indeed, um, maybe somewhat due to some of the disconnections we've got and the field spreading out a little bit, but yeah, I do have to agree with you and being a very clean race, although things might get a little bit dirty as Leonatoki really gets into the dirty air now of Ross McGregor and the Bentley versus the Lamborghini. Wouldn't it be pretty crazy, Ewan, if in the Lamborghini's first outing in the sprint series, it was able to take that top step off the podium? Yeah, it really would. The BMW wasn't able to do that back at Laguna Seca. It put in a good performance, getting in fourth place, but one of these kind of odd cars, and one of the cars that have been trialled for a race and a race Racer only, have never been able to get into those top couple of places. And so, so uh, yeah, yeah, there, there we, we have it. it. First and second, nose to tail, Bentley versus Lamborghini, Lamborghini and it would indeed. indeed uh, not, not be the, the first Bentley race, race victory we've seen all season, season, but we haven't seen it win for quite a long time. time. I don't actually believe we have seen it win so far. Just uh, have a quick look. Um, no, we haven't. Um, so there you have it. First Bentley race win. This might be it. Other than Silverstone, possibly, um, where it, uh, there was indeed the first Bentley race victory. But uh, it's taken a long time for one to come. Maybe two is going to come along in two weeks. Well, what's still in the Bentley back at Silverstone? They were indeed, oh. and uh, the top four were all Bentleys in that race. In fact, seven of the top ten were. So that's a pretty uh, Bentley fest last week well. or two weeks ago at, uh, at at Silverstone. We do occasionally on stream like to have a bit of Bentley bashing, but last time out at Silverstone, it was Bentley bashing the other way around. It, that, well, Bentley were bashing everybody else. That was the problem, really, um, and nobody else could get anywhere near them. But this battle now is really heating up. Less than four temps across the line and absolutely nose to tail through the first sector. Under 15 minutes to go in this session, but the Enotoki not quite as strong through that first sector there. It seems that the Lamborghini may be a little bit better at uh, high speed rather than the Bentley, which I would not uh, put down as a particularly agile car, but through the pretty twisty first sector, it's pulled out a little small margin there. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the Bentley's just one of those all-round cars. We were talking about it before, how the Bentley just seems to do kind of decently at everything. And maybe uh, Marco Payich is in the YouTube chat and could actually just let us know what the strengths of that Lamborghini are and where we can really watch for Leon Otoki to make a move onto Ross McGregor. Either way, you'd have to think one of the biggest points will be down into turn 14. We saw um, uh, it was... Matt Beavis' is a teammate, pardon me, I can't remember who John was Clements. in. John Clements. John Clements, there we go, in the Porsche, made a lot of moves down into 14, and we'll have to see whether Leon Otoki can uh, emulate that. Yeah, he did. It's always hard to remember, actually, single drivers in this series sometimes, because we're often so focused on team names and numbers that sometimes forget who's uh, who's driving. I had to think quite hard about who Ross McGregor was uh, who, who had taken over from a couple of minutes ago, but it was John Munro uh, doing the first stint. Marco Pates did the first stint in the Lamborghini. Now they're able to watch along and enjoy the show, really, but I don't think they're going to be enjoying it so much 
Uh, and their fingernails certainly aren't either, because they're going to be getting shorter and shorter by the second what here. What fingernails, With, Ewan? Yeah, well, yeah, precisely. Uh, what fingernails? After all this, it's going to be pretty um, nail-biting stuff um, for both teams involved. Well, I don't think they'll want any dinner after this, after all the fingernails that they've been eating. Uh, but Leonatoki, seven tenths behind Ross McGregor. The gap has kind of stabilized at this point. And right now, if you're Leonatoki, you just need to be sitting in that Lambo and just watching Ross McGregor thinking, okay, where are you making your mistakes? Where am I going faster than you? Where can I look for that overtaking opportunity? Maybe just show your nose a few times, throw Ross off. Maybe show your nose in a corner where you don't plan to make that overtaking maneuver just so that Ross is has to think, has to be considerate and uh, just put him under as much pressure as you can. Yeah, indeed. And just coming up across one of the lap cars at the moment. This is Stephen Salsgaard in the Aston Martin just in front. And this could play a big role in this battle. With 12 minutes to go, any gaps are not unrecoverable for Leon Otoki. But it just depends how um, how nice Salsgaard is going to be in terms of his getting out the way. So as they come down the straight now to complete 67 laps, we're going to get over 70 in this one. These guys are going to be getting dizzy before long with a relatively short lap time here at Mazzano. And now we are getting into the traffic. It is starting to slow Ross McGregor ever so slightly. A tiny bit of dirty. Obviously, it's not that much of a factor in GT3 cars, but it can slow you down. And even having that car there is a distraction and takes away from your pace as Salzgaard gets completely off the road to get out of the way. Ross McGregor was able to get through quite cleanly, but I think Mian Otoki just hesitated ever so slightly. He wasn't quite sure where the Aston Martin was going to go, and he maybe lost a tenth in that. Yep, he may have lost a bit of time, but he'll close right on up. Leon Otoki definitely has more pace than Ross McGregor. We've seen Otoki close into McGregor half a second per lap. Um, on some laps, it was the same, but on other laps, Leon Otoki really did close in by an absolute massive amount. But now that he's in striking range, he just can't quite pull off the move. Ten and a half minutes remaining, or ten minutes and 45 seconds, and that not even six laps here at Misano. Leonatoki needs to get the hurry up and needs to find a way through pretty soon. And uh, it will see if he can do. It's going to be a battle right to the death here between these two. Now we're going to see who's going to come out on top. It's going to be very, very exciting to watch. That is for sure. Currently, by the way, Johannes Weiss is the, the final man and lap down. We've got six cars on the lap at the moment. And uh, looks like Richard Schaefer crossed the line not too long ago. He's 10 seconds up the road. So um, I'm just going to check the lap times. He's being caught by a second a lap. So um, there's maybe not 10 laps left in this. But uh, if Schaefer makes a mistake, then there could be even more traffic to contend with. However, I think they're free of most of the traffic. And now it's just uh, man versus man here for this race victory. It's a pure, clean battle. The circuit is totally their own right now and uh, no interference is going to come from anybody um, either behind or in front, I don't think. Well, at least we uh, hope not. They've got a lot of room out on circuit and Leonatoki can just uh, focus on hunting down McGregor. McGregor can just focus on keeping the car on circuit and just maintaining, you know, the half a second plus a gap to Leonatoki. We make our way into 9 and 10 once again and I think Ross McGregor will get a much better exit coming out of the hairpin. He does indeed and gets a, quite a slingshot actually out of that final corner. And uh, Atoki, as we mentioned, very young driver. Not often uh, competing in uh, international events, but now is uh, really starting to prove himself in, in some of these after competing in Germany for quite a, lot, a long time. Quite a while, and it can't have been that long, but uh, given his age. But still, you get some increasingly young people being very, very quick actually. Um, in, in sim racing I've noticed um, but uh, now coming through the final corner here Otoki is going to really try to apply the pressure to Ross McGregor and uh, this battle this win would be so treasured by either of these teams if they were either of these uh, squads obviously Euronics have already got a, a win for their team this season however this 58 hasn't and simply race haven't had a win at all so the win would really be treasured by both teams 
both squads if they were able to get this. And don't forget, this is going to be a big third place as well for Paul Simsball. They've picked up a second place before. That was back at Kayalami. That was an absolutely fantastic run for them. Mm -hmm. But their best result aside from that was a fourth place, which was last time out at Silverstone. So, come the end of the season, Paul Simsball also doing a decent job. Same can be said for Team Rookie Monsters, Matt Beavis and Hinsai having a stellar result. Hinsai actually having, I think, probably his best running of the entire season. I don't think I've seen him inside the top 10 before. Uh, we'll check that briefly. I think that uh, that might be right, actually. The 73 Team Rookie Monsters managed a 8th place back at Spa. But we have never seen him inside the top five. Eighth place is the best they have ever had. And so they might be able to go uh, quite a couple better here with a fifth position hanging on from Richard Schaefer. And they may well be able to do that with the um, roughly 15 second margin that they have uh, right now. So uh, that's a great drive from both of those guys uh, in the 73. Vickers and Sy fully deserve that, uh, that result. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be really good for them to cross the line and take that but um yeah really really interesting battle now seven minutes to go and uh, the, the, this race is going to come down as Hintzai as we mentioned him gets a drive-through penalty not entirely sure what that was for but it was probably for uh, corner cutting or track extending and that's a real shame he is going to fall down to sixth and that is still going to be a great result for him but that has got to be a little bit disappointing Oh, the old commentator cursor coming in. Hinsai's about 20 seconds, I want to say, ahead of Richard Schaefer. It's more like 17, to be honest. So he should drop behind Richard Schaefer unless Schaefer himself makes a mistake. And Sai will find himself slap bang in between the two Butler Pal Motorsport cars. But Leonatoki still hunts down Ross McGregor. Lap 70. And I think there's probably about five laps left, including this one. So Otoki still has some time available. And when does he pull the trigger? Does he have anything left in that Lamborghini? By the way, it's all on Otoki now. Can he find a way through? Can he put the pressure on Ross McGregor in these final few moments of the race? Well, he already is applying the pressure, but can it turn into anything fruitful for him? It's going to be four laps to go when we cross the line here now. So there is still quite a few opportunities. We're going to get 75 laps of this race, it looks like, which is uh, quite a lot. But as I mentioned, not the longest lap time around here. And a good exit from Leonatoki down into turn one. But this is not an overtaking opportunity, particularly uh, just under five tenths is the margin. But they are very close as they run through this first sector once again. Using a little bit more curb there was a Toki. But uh, now just getting the run is Ross McGregor and running a little bit wide for a Toki. So this battle continues on, rumbles on. Can a Toki make the difference and get this win? This is going to be so fiercely fought for when the battling does commence in earnest side by side. There is going to be contact. It's going to get physical and hopefully it doesn't end in, uh, in tears for one of them. But um, you can be sure they're not going to let this one go easily, either of them. Yeah, and I guess the best thing as well is that even if there is contact and a big shunt as well, they'll still finish first and second in some order because Simon Crane is uh, about 30 seconds behind these two as Ross McGregor just um, gets the old point and square exit out in the Bentley out Ooh. of a turn 10. And they should be able to hold on to the position, but Otoki is a pretty close as they make their way through turn 11 through Corvone down into turn 12. Toki looking very close to the back of McGregor as they make their way in to 13. And Toki's too far back to dive it down the inside into 14. First signs of defence though from Ross McGregor just on the exit of turn 10. Wasn't quite sure of himself on the exit. Wasn't quite sure that he got the exit that he needed to defend down into the braking zone at turn 14. However, he did in the end. And Toki didn't want to uh, uh, push the, the issue there. So three laps to go now as they cross the line. This is getting increasingly exciting and increasingly close. Otoki may be looking down the inside. Ross McGregor gave him the room and the real estate to actually try that, but Otoki didn't want to take it in the end. And now the moves are really starting to be made. The first sign of a defense half a lap ago, the first sign of an attack from Otoki. And now this race is really on. Three and a half minutes remaining. 
And that is going to be three laps, including this one. Although, that being said, Ewan, I think you know how bad my maths is. So it's probably only going to be two laps, knowing that. But Atoki closes into McGregor, and it's all about the exit from this next corner. Turn nine and turn ten. How close can Atoki get? Can he throw Ross McGregor off? Well, the answer is no, not quite. And McGregor will have himself a nice little bit of breathing air between himself and Atoki on the run into the quadruple right-hander. Yeah, did much better on that occasion, did Ross McGregor in his defense of that first position. Now coming down to the sweepers at the end of the lap and the third sector. Here we go. And uh, trying to... Oh, get a big slide there for Otoki. Just a little bit of opposite lock to correct it. And there is traffic. I can see a car in the distance there. There is traffic. And with two laps to go here, there could be some more drama to play out here. And final corner, a little bit wide for Otoki, though. He's going to lose some temps there. So two minutes, two laps to play this one out and traffic to throw into the mix. This is just going to get extremely, extremely exciting. And, uh, yeah, this you is... Where's wow. your money at right now? Ross McGregor, Leon Otoki. Well, I'm probably going to go for Ross McGregor, actually, so far. But uh, ah, I don't I think it's going to be without Ross. a fight. I, I was putting my money on Ross. I'll be devil's advocate. I'm going to go for Leon. I reckon he'll uh, pull off a move. There's a, he runs a little bit wide, but he actually can use that to his advantage just to get a nice run coming out of uh, turn at five and at six. And he is there close. This is probably the second best overtaking opportunity down into turn eight. And he's a little bit too far back to make the move into Queroa. Oh, it's mistake. So I think Ross, yeah, Ross McGregor's made a bit of a mistake. Here comes Leon Otoki. He's going to look for the outside. McGregor has to go defensive. There's the contact that you expected, You Can Otoki get the runner coming through turn 10? Because he wants to make the move through the triple right-hander or quadruple right-hander down into 14. Otoki's probably got the best run that he has all race along. Yeah, the Bentley just has such good traction off turn 10. It makes it very difficult down here, but Otoki is seeing some of his last chances right now. He might want to go for one of these. Oh, oh McGregor, another McGregor. mistake from McGregor, and he's going to try and get down the inside. Otoki can't do it again, though. A couple of mistakes now from the Englishman up in front, and this is getting very, very difficult for both of these guys up front. Wide again at the penultimate corner. You can see that he's looking in his mirrors a lot. He's not comfortable with the German right in behind him. One lap to go, and this is going to come right down to the wire between these two. Oh, yes, it will. Leon Otoki's all over the back of McGregor. He's going to look for it. Inside into do this. Contact McGregor goes sideways. Otoki's going to, like, bang him back straight. He'll swat him behind. He's still got moments. Good stuff from Otoki to put McGregor back facing the right direction. But I tell you what, Ross McGregor, he's sweating. There is sweat dropping all over his face. From his armpit, it's his hands are sweaty. I hope he's got some racing gloves on because otherwise he's going to be slipping all over the place. Otoki's got one lap left. This is the final lap for a talkie. It's going to be the final chances as well. One of them could have been down here into turn eight, but it's not going to be for him. He breaks very late once again, closes up once again, and now he's going to try and get the run off the corner, down the inside, maybe even into turn nine and ten. He's been pretty strong here before. Is he going to go for it? He is! There's contact! And the Bentley is pushed wide. McGregor goes wide, and now Atoki's down the inside. They rub again off the corner, and they run side by side down the back straight now on the very final lap. One of the Lexus is in the way at the moment. Hopefully he doesn't play a role as the Benley has got the position once again with a straight line of speed. Now Atoki back into the slipstream. Can he go for one last lunge? A last gap, gasp maneuver maybe for Atoki. But it's not there. Ross McGregor looks like he may just hold on here. He's done a, such a phenomenal drive and he actually might do this. I thought Otoki would have it, but despite all the rubbing and all of the racing throughout this event so far, Ross McGregor is going to come under fire for the final corner, but he's not going to be passed. Ross McGregor and Simply Race win at Mazzano. Oh my god. God, Ewan, what a race. What a way to end it. And Ross McGregor, I have got to give him so much credit. He read Leon Otoki like an absolute book.
heading down into turn 9 and 10. He knew Leonotoki was going to go for that dive bomb, and he parked it right on the apex of the corner. Leonotoki had nowhere to go, but tap into the back of McGregor. McGregor held it. He held on to the position. He takes the win. Absolutely fantastic. Simon Crane takes third. Matt Beavis will I take fourth. What a race, Ewan. Yeah, Marco Pejic and Leon Otoki continue to get closer, but they cannot get that race win for the life of them at the moment. Coming fourth at the Nürburgring, the second last time out at Silverstone, second again here at Mizano. That is just a phenomenal way to end the race, and I hope we get to talk to John Munro or Ross McGregor, um, but I'm sure they're pretty pleased with how that race has gone at the moment. Just one of the best finishes uh, I, I have seen anyway. Atoki gave it a, such a good go, but in the end, McGregor has to be really uh, complimented for his defense in that one. Really firm, really fair as well. There was a little bit of rubbing between the two of them, but it was a really fair and really great battle. Yeah, that was absolutely incredible. But we can talk about how incredible that action, that final lap was for quite a while. So we're going to be heading into a short break. And when we're back, we'll hopefully be having Ross McGregor and Leon Otoki in the commentary booth with us for a, a quick chat. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back with post-race interviews. Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. Their three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization. You don't have to worry about that anymore. He has a job, son! Welcome back to the GTR 24H Sprint Series here from Mazzano, where we have just seen possibly, probably, actually definitely, the best race finish of the whole season involving Ross McGregor and Leon Otoki, that battle right towards the end of the race. And we've got the uh, the winners of that battle, Ross McGregor and John Munro, both joining us here in the booth for a post-race interview. We'll start with Ross uh, with the first question. I guess it's the obvious one, but um, it's, it's what we all want to know, really. 
how on earth did you hang on to that and how were the nerves throughout that uh, final couple of laps because Otoki was really really applying a lot of pressure towards the end of that uh, uh, towards the end of that race yeah um, pressure is one way to describe it um that was actually okay um i kind of knew that it was going to be a struggle to overtake because of like the kind of aero wash and stuff like that um but yeah it was, it was okay um just that he was catching really quickly during that stint and then i thought well he's going to pass me easily but then when it got within the second um it kind of stayed that way for for a long time so i was pretty confident holding on um and as you saw it was going to take something quite desperate to get past so thankfully he gave the place back so all good yeah it was it was all nice and fair even if there was uh, a few bits of contact in there it was all nice and fair and uh, and whatever and uh, sp speaking of which one of those watching john Munro, teammate of course um how how was it uh, watching along uh, i guess uh, we often hear when there's big battles like this that it's actually easier to be in the car because you're not quite as nervous whereas when you're watching you're just kind of powerless and don't really have uh, anything that you, you can do about it but yeah how was it uh, just watching that battle because it was it was great to watch for me but um uh, for me and yusuf and everyone at home but when you're actually involved in it it, it it is quite different isn't it yeah absolutely i think watching i'd say the last lap was was probably the most stressful just looking in the mirror at the lambo but um before then i wasn't i wasn't too fussed i knew how much the aero wash would affect the car because we were basically in the same position in stint one but in reverse so i had the lambo ahead of me and i was a bit quicker at catching them but then i couldn't get past so i kind of knew how difficult it is to actually pass when the cars are that similarly matched so um and also obviously i, I trust ross he's he's a very seasoned uh, sim racer and he knows how to defend well and keep it clean so i was i was confident in him but it, it did get stressful for the last few laps and especially when you started seeing that lambo making some moves down, down the inside and stuff so you no know, it was it was exciting stuff but i'm delighted that we could hold on yeah i bet and uh, just speaking of those pit stops you, you managed to actually jump um the lamborghini completely in that cycle and and i'll ask uh, i'll ask ross how did you do that because it was uh, nose to tail when you came in you stayed out a lap longer than the lamborghini but you popped out five seconds in front so um so what was going on what was going on there well, to be honest, the whole season, myself and John, we've just done excellent, excellent pit stops. I don't think we've actually had an issue. Um, for this race, actually, during the race, John just said, hang on, I haven't actually pr practiced pit entry yet. So we just had to kind of like talk him through it like during the race. So the pit stop was just good as we normally do. And uh, yeah, John just got the hammer down and uh, that was it. Just pulled away. Yeah, just sorry about the pit stop. Um, as I said, I've never raced at Mizano before, so I realised about halfway through the stint, I didn't have, I didn't know where the pit lane entry was. So what Ross actually did is he left the server, did a few laps himself, and practiced pit lane entry, and then told me where to brake and where to turn in and stuff. So I had him telling me brake halfway down the white building, and then you'll get to the limiter. So I just pushed on the in lap, did that, and and obviously it ended up getting us the race win. So we kind of lucked into that one, but um, I'm glad we glad we could be prepared. Well, that is trust, by the way. Just to uh, him telling you when to when to break. That is that severe trust in you too, mate. That is. Yeah, yeah um, John. What's your pin number? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, yeah, that's not going to be revealed. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. Tune um, in next time on yeah. Prince Henry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anyway, we've obviously got one more round to go of uh, of the sprint series. You guys have had a pretty fantastic season, particularly towards the second half. Um, in this kind of, uh, over, well, me and Yusuf are kind of over hype in this fight for fourth in the championship between you and uh, you, you and your Onyx. But you have had a couple of po or a podium at least um, towards the end of this season. Um, so uh, what what are you expecting from Monza, and uh, what what can you take away from this from this season so far? I know it's not over yet, but um, what can you guys really? Uh, obviously, you get, you're going to be pretty pleased with the, getting the race win and the podiums and uh, and whatever. But uh, what can you guys take away from this? And uh, what are you expecting and hoping for at Monza? Um, well, to be honest, the whole season um, we've had a bit of bad luck. We've picked up a lot of like six and seven places, um, but that was off the back of you know being involved in incidents and things like that. Um, so I think when we kind of do everything right, don't get involved in incidents. We're kind of capable of like the podium. Um, I think there's a couple of teams ahead that I think both of us would admit are are super fast and would struggle to beat them uh, without a bit of luck on our side. But yeah, I think we can we can realistically um, predict maybe a podium as possible. But yeah, it's been good fun this season. Um, a few incidents, we missed a couple of races as well, 
Um, but I think we've shown that once we kind of get everything together, we are capable of getting a podium. And uh, yeah, it also helps when John qualifies because he's a much, much better qualifier than me. Um, and that's what we did for this round. So that's worked out fantastic. So I'm quite happy. And uh, and John, what are you uh, are you looking forward to Monza? And uh, what are you uh, and what and what you uh, what will you look back on the season uh, uh, with? Yeah, it, it, I mean, I'm looking forward to Monza for a start. I think the Bentley will be nice and strong there. Um, it was kind of ironic that we ended up taking the win at Mizano because we really didn't think the Bentley was going to work here, but we just knew it was a consistent race car. So we thought, well, Ross didn't have much time to prepare for it. So we thought, well, we'll, we'll take the car we know, um, whereas Monza should suit us a little bit more. I think we'll see a lot of Mercs, though. But um, as, as Ross said, I think I think when things go our way and, and we you know we get it together and don't have bad luck, we are capable of a podium. But we also are aware that there's a couple of other teams that if they don't have things uh, go wrong for them, then they, they're obviously going to be up there as well so you know tonight was an example of, of luck going our way but we've had a lot of examples where it hasn't gone our way um, and, and obviously we missed a few rounds as well so yeah I think it's been a great season I think we've we've improved as the season's gone on with our driving as well and um, yeah it's, it's been it's been great fun hopefully we can come back and actually fight for the championship because I think now uh, you know we're fourth in the championship we're only you know maybe a, a win's worth away from third uh, and that big battle at the front so maybe you know if we can compete at all the rounds and get get, get less caught up in incidents then you know maybe we'd be able to put up a championship fight yeah that would be great to see and uh, yeah i wish you luck with that but uh, obviously one more round to go in a couple of weeks time but uh, either way thank you very much for talking to us john mcgregor and ross mcgregor both of the simply race number 23 bentley ended up uh, winning that race thank you very much to both of you uh, for for talking to us cheers thank you and uh, yeah there you go two very uh, very happy drivers indeed from um simply race and uh, yeah, Yusuf, it's it's very good to see those guys get that race win. Very deserved as well, given that they've persevered throughout the season, despite the fact, as they mentioned there, they've had some bad luck, but uh, they've persevered throughout, and uh, yeah, they've uh, they managed to get their race win, which uh, obviously they're obviously very pleased about. Yeah, of course, always good to have some happy Scotsmen to interview. <laughs> Much better than having angry Scotsmen. Um, not not re referring to John Monroe and Ross McGregor, but uh, I have had that pleasure let's say before um either way we've had five different race winners now you and what do you think monza can you get a sixth quite well quite possibly actually given the way this season has gone so far it's very unpredictable very um yeah just just unpredictable really uh, and you never really know who's going to take the race win obviously you know that the kind of teams that are going to be up there but uh, you never really know who's going to take the race win and uh, i'm slightly scared actually that uh, if ross mcgregor re-watches this and i did actually call him english once in that well you in that didn't. battle i did so i'm going to be in big trouble if he watches oh, it back so let's make sure he doesn't do that with the angry scotsman now uh, yes i'm very uh, I, I, as soon as he started talking i was like oh dear here we go because uh, he is, I saw I saw British on there, but I accidentally said I didn't even mean to say English, but I said it, um, and I can't take that back now. So um, I am in trouble if Ross McGregor um, does indeed watch that back. But um, don't worry, if he doesn't, I'll tell him to watch it back. No, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, let's uh, let's hope not. Um, it doesn't look like we're actually going to be uh, joined by anybody else for an interview. However, uh, we and we're talking a little bit like the season's over, really, but. There's still two rounds to go. Uh, round. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> in two weeks' time, there's still a round to go at Monza. And, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to it. However, the turn one, two business is going to be uh, one to watch, that's for sure. Yeah, it will be. And um, I might as well just say some final few words before Ewan does uh, the old sign-off. We're at Italy, so I thought, why not? Grazie ragazzi per vedere. Ci vediamo in due settimane per la gara di Monza. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could tell you what the, uh, that actually says, but I haven't got any idea. And hopefully... Pe <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, the, yeah. I, I don't know what uh, that exactly... He could, actually, he could have said something very rude, actually, but uh, he oh, probably I, didn't. I did that just for um, my boy uh, Alessio Pusquedo, my fellow Sardinian. Oh, I see, yeah, um, the, uh, yes, uh, speaking a bit of Italian there, that not many people are going to understand, but uh, obviously Yusuf knows, um, but, uh, but... The thing but is, I guarantee it. you, Alessio, probably, or any of the Mosto drivers listened to that, and they thought, oh my god, his Italian grammar is so bad. <laughs> Maybe. 
but um, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly better than mine. That's for sure. Um, I can't, I can't, yeah, I just can't, can't do it really. But uh, yeah, just just one final thing to round off, by the way. Mm. Uh, as you may have seen um, in the news for GTR 24, we're now on Amazon Prime. We're pretty much on every platform that has ever provided a streaming service in its history, really. The news, um, we, yes. We're pretty much on, uh, well, we're everywhere, really, now. Um, uh, and that is great. We've got many exciting things coming up soon. And the uh, the Le Mans 24-hour race in about a month's time, a month and a week, let's say, five weeks' yeah. time, five or six weeks, is fully booked now. Um, so we've got a 40 car grid of uh, big hitters and uh, yeah that's going to be a fantastic uh, race to watch isn't it so it, in two weeks time we're going to have the monza sprint series race and then a few more weeks and then we're going to have that le mans 24 hours which is going to be really 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 good yeah i can confirm the last race at matsuzuka was pretty entertaining and with almost double the cars on circuit it's going to be um absolutely awesome it definitely is. So make sure you join us for both of those broadcasts. We'll be back in two weeks for the Monza two-hour race here as uh, we continue on the final double Italian header um, for this sprint series. But that has been it. I've been Ewan O'Leary and uh, Yusuf Pinto has been alongside me as ever. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time in Monza. However, that is it from us now. Until in two weeks' time, we'll see you at Monza. But it's goodbye for now. you do but you don't have to worry about that anymore he has a job, son! Complexity is a Danish designer and manufacturer of high-grade sim racing platforms. There are three different levels of platforms come in a variety of colors and configurations. Choose from the V4, built from 40 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles, the V8, built from 80 by 40 mm profiles, and the high-tier V12, built from 160 by 40 mm extruded aluminium profiles. Prices range from 470 to 750 euros. Go to facebook.com slash simplexity.eu and start a messenger chat to inquire more about the options for colors and customization.